Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? Oh man, this is gonna be a spicy one today. Going in hot. Hot, I say. Children. I was desperately trying to get Aubrey Huff on this show. He's trending on Twitter right now. Go have a look why. It's very pertinent to today's topic, which is the victory of modern women. They've won. That's it. It's over. Game's over. Got game over, man. You guys like this thumbnail? I'll explain that here. Coming up. All right, all right, all right, all right. Settle down, settle down, settle down. Oh, man. Oh, boy. Epic thumbnail. Well, you know what? Uh, thank you, African scientist. <laughs> but I'm not responding. I did not do that. My I, Well, I mean, I do all of my own thumbnails, actually. People ask me that. Like, who does all those crazy thumbnails? That's me. Um, I, in another life, uh, actually, and still in this life, I am a graphic designer, artist, art director, brand manager, brand identity guy. I've been doing that for a while. I, that, that's, uh, that was my former incarnation. Uh, I'm still kind of in that incarnation, but uh, I still have all of my old tool set. I still have all of my skills. So that's why. I don't think anybody else really kind of, you know, the thing that really disappoints me about thumbnails uh, today is it seems like people have this idea that the, the crappier they are, the more attention they're going to generate because they seem like more authentic because like, like the less polished they are the more authentic they are <laughs> I, I don't understand that reasoning but uh there you have it maybe that's just the, maybe i'm just old maybe i'm just an okay boomer right no i'm not um i was gonna have aubrey huff on i was desperately working to get him on here uh he has didn't have computer access and i could have put him through the board on my phone but i have not linked my phone to my board because i've never had to do that so uh aubrey i'm going to work something out with him and hopefully rich cooper for like a special show tomorrow uh, and I'll tell you why that is um, right here at the beginning. Uh, the Greyhound cam is uh, not up right now. Sorry. They're actually, they're not, are they? No, they're not in the room right now. I have to go look over and see if they're even around. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I usually, uh, I, for Wednesday shows, sometimes I let, I'll let them in here. But, uh, not today. Not today. You want me to bring Ned on? I'll put, I'll tell you what, I'll, 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 I'll make you a deal here, uh, Matt. I'll put, uh, I'll put Ned and Bambi on Instagram today and you can go check out the recent current pictures of my my pooches anyways um so today i have to i'm gonna just gonna start right out the gate here because this is just too good not to do this at this point here because this is I, I it's trending in the u.s i don't know if it's trending worldwide but i will just throw this up here really quickly um this is a big tweet from uh, i of course i decided i was going to hit on this today um Aubrey threw this out there. It's, it's, I, I, you know, I, it's going viral. I'll just say it. It's going, I think it's kind of viral. At least it's trending on Twitter right now. He says, I've never understood as a man why you would date or marry a single mother if you're single with no kids of your own. Uh, seems to me he doesn't feel he has options or doesn't value himself as a man. I'd feel like I was a backup plan helping raise another man's kid. If there was ever a tweet, <laughs> from Aubrey Huff that uh, that was in my wheelhouse. This is it. So uh, I thought I'd I'd, uh, I'd lead off with this because it really kind of digs into what I, today's topic and what I wanted to talk about today. There's a lot of other. I, actually, you know what? Hang on. Before I before I dump this one, I do have to put this up here. I, I answered a couple of things here, and of course we have uh, Lydia from uh, Tim Cast who follows me and I follow her, but I have yet to make a connection with Tim. Just saying, uh, Dana Lash here. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dana Lash. She's a, a, a talk, a conservative talk show radio hostess. 
a uh, really big uh, NRA advocate. That's the only reason I know her because of that. But uh, she's she in concern. Oh, I, guess, I think Pat Campbell probably knows Dana as well. And of course, she chimes in here and she says, daughter of a single mom here. My stepdad didn't feel like a backup plan. He was committed to my mom first and stepped up when my biological father failed. Well, I learned a lot. Okay. I don't know the personal history here, but I'm just going to, I'm going to spitball a little bit here in a minute. Uh, I learned a lot from him, including what sort of behavior to expect from men and myself, not your best take my friend. Okay. Well, let's just, uh, let's parse this out just briefly here. I, I'm going to, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to work something out. Yeah, I do my own thumbnails, Tom. Um, I'm going to try to work out a, like a dedicated show with with Aubrey tomorrow. And maybe I'll, and if I can get Rich in, if, I, if Rich will commit on a moment's notice. Rich, if you're watching, I want to get you on with Aubrey tomorrow if that's a possibility. Um, damn, I am out of focus. Am I out of focus today? There we go. I'm still monkeying with all this stuff. So uh, when I when I see stuff like this, you you know me. So I, I, I've written extensively on the uh, war on paternity. I've written extensively on uh, polyamory, which is coming out, which is really something I think that's sort of becoming normalized. And I think what's funny right now is when you see someone like Dana Lash, who is a very conservative, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's what she's built her reputation on. That's what she's built her career on is being like a conservative talk show host uh, here in the United States. And um, again, nothing against her like politically or for her politically. I'm just saying that when stuff like this comes out, as I have said in the past, when we're talking about the sisterhood, when we're talking about just, you know, women's interests and what I've called the fempowerment narrative, when a guy steps in and says something that is unflattering to the female to female nature or unflat even even marginally it's not like he was like throwing rock it's not like aubrey was he was just saying i don't understand why guys would want to do something like this and everybody jumps down his throat now you expect that from women who are sort of like you know wokies right uh the social justice warriors um the social justice narrative we expect that okay you're going to get those and you're going to get the guys who are going to be they're not even men they're, they're the allies the allies are going to jump down too right they're they're basically feminists with penises but when we see someone like dana lash come in on this now you see what i mean when i talk about the sisterhood uber Alice. and I, again I'll, I'll i'm going to paraphrase myself uh when it comes to ideology when it comes to religion when it comes to uh culture when it comes to ethnicity when it comes to uh you you name it right any any kind of like ideological affiliation or alignment with women is always 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 superseded by the feminine imperative always the sisterhood uber Alice. that means the sisterhood overall above all so when something like this happens, when when uh, when when a Rolo Tomasi or a an Aubrey Huff jumps in and has even one take, you will see women of of what you would who would otherwise come to blows <laughs> over ethnicity or over uh, culture or over politics or over religion. When that guy uh, in some way even insinuates that he is attacking. The feminine imperative, they will lock arms and join forces and fight you tooth and nail. And that's what's happening here. And the reason for that is because people have such an investment today in paternity. And people say, well, what do you mean paternity? You know, this is single moms. He's attacking single moms. How dare he? And yeah, you know, whenever you do that and whenever, um, whenever Rich, like Rich Cooper does not have the pull that Aubrey Huff does. Sorry, Rich, I, I love you to death, but let's just you know let's call a spade a spade here like aubrey has has a little bit more gravitas than both of us combined but when rich says something like this when rich and rich has been known for doing talks about you know why do you why you should avoid single mothers as a as a policy for guys why you should you know why it's a bad idea um they usually approach this from a an after the after the fact um an after the fact, like post facto, right? An after the fact decision. So here's why you shouldn't. I always tell guys why they feel like they shouldn't, because I think a lot of guys when it, when it comes to um to getting with like like getting after it with a single mom, 
there is, this has become a, a mating strategy for guys who are lower on the SMV scale, right? They're low value men. And I don't mean low value as in you don't have a lot of money. I don't mean low value in the terms of, well, you're just, you're this beta simp. I mean it in the sense that you're low value in the sense that you would accept that, accept a, a single mother as a prospective long-term mate choice. And I think that women on some level of consciousness understand that. They understand that alpha guys are the guys they can't lock down. Beta guys are the guys who are going to, oh, I'm going to step up. I'm going to like, like Dana, Dana Lash was saying here. Oh, he, I learned a lot from him about men's nature. Yeah, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you learned about it from his, uh, you know, investment in you and an investment in a child that's not his. And I think on some sort of evolutionary, like limbic level that there's this idea that, well, here's a guy who is going against the evolutionary order and I'm not saying that that's the highest authority. I'm just saying that there is something that feels a little off about that. And that same feeling of being off is exactly what most guys feel when they f discover that a woman has a child with another man. And that's becoming increasingly difficult these days because right now, and I threw this on, the, on that thread, you can go look at it if you'd like, 42% of, of children. Oh, this is the average on average, 42% of children in Western or in Europe for sure. And at least 40, I think as high as 43% of children in the United States have been, are, are, have been, or will be born out of wedlock. That is not by chance. That is by design. And you can see where that increase begins right around the sexual revolution. So when we go, oh, well, it's just the, the sign of the times, or it's just this difficult thing, or it's just, oh, it's, and of course, you're going to get this as well. It's going to, you usually get this from like sort of ally, you know, male allies, or you get it from like the, the liberal side, although you're going to see it in, well, I've seen it already increasingly on the more conservative side of things when it comes to women, is that it's the man's fault. And I, I wanted to, to emphasize that. Because that gets us into what I want to talk about today, which is, which is modern women. And this is not going to be bash women day. Okay. This is also going to be a little bit of like why you think certain things about those women. But statistically, let's look at a few things here. We already know that, and I can show them to you. Actually, let me just put this up here real quick. Uh, now these, this is the, these are European stats. So I'm just going to throw these on here just for giggles. All right. So this is, here we go. Man, you can't even see that. Sorry, I, 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 I apologize. It's a little, a little bit small. Maybe I can, can I scope in? Yeah, I can a little bit. All right, so here you have it. Um, these are the, these are the rates of live births that are born outside of marriage. And this is so the yellow, the yellow lines are two thousand. Uh, the blue lines are two thousand eighteen. So we're already looking, I mean, this is only an 18 year span. Okay. So this is 18 years. You're an adult. If you're born in 2000, you're an adult right now, technically. If you're born in any one of these countries, you can see the out of birth, out of wedlock births that have been taking place. Uh, let me uh, see if I can expand this a little bit there. There, now you can see the, the down here, the thing. So. There you go. That, so this is where I'm getting stats from. I'm not just pulling this out of my ass. This is this is the real deal. Okay. Um, if you, if, it's not hard to find these stats. Let's just let's let me just clarify that right now. I'm not just going. Oh, I'm just going to go cherry pick whatever I can. These are, you can go to the CDC and find these stats. Okay. It's not hard. It takes you all of five seconds to go look this up on Google. Welcome to the new enlightenment, the new information age enlightenment. You can do that. So the, uh, uh, the Carl, the, when did this start? It started right. The, well, here's what, here's the thing is when you go and you look at the statistics from like right around 1965 till, uh, well, 2020, I guess I don't, because 2020 is almost over. So we don't really have stats for 2020 yet, but we will soon. Um, so if you look at it from like, say nine, let's just say 1970. Okay. Let's round it off. Uh, I, I peg the sexual revolution right around 1965, 66, somewhere in there. Um, as, as a result of hormonal birth control that is unilaterally controlled by women. And a lot of social upheaval in Western cultures, what we see right now, what we sort of take for granted right now, um, like for instance, the thumbnail that I showed right here, that, um, that illustration actually comes from, actually, let me put that back up there again. You guys can, I was going to say, do I have to actually go hunt that picture down? No, I don't. I've got it right here. This picture right here on the left 
Um, I, and I can't, I can't remember the guy's last name. In fact, I probably couldn't even pronounce it. It's Adrian something or other. This is not something I just like went and whipped up. It's something that's going around the internet right now because it's on the cover of the New Yorker magazine and this illustrator, Adrian, God damn it. What's his name? Um, he, I, I actually am familiar with this guy because he does some really great illustrations, like in other, in other ways as well. But he does, um, you know, political stuff. He, sometimes he does humorous stuff. He's got his own, like, kind of like comic book, graphic novels, I guess, in this style. And this was, he's done covers before. And I thought this was interesting because people pick up on this. And what I think he was trying, what Adrian was trying to do here with this image was illustrate, like, life in 2020. Like, this is what we've been reduced to. You'll notice, you'll see the, uh, the uh, what is it, the Amazon packages down there being delivered to the door. Uh, I Love New York is down there. She's got two cats. She's got some, probably some disinfectant, her, her gloves, her masks. Uh, toilet paper also defines that. If you look at the Cheetos in the back, I thought that was a nice touch. Then you can see the, um, you can see the, uh, the prescription meds on the desk. She's got her books and her laptop. And what's funny is you see this just utter disaster going on. And of course, there's another cat behind her. Uh, I, I had to sort of uh, cut off some of the, the background here. If you, if you see the whole image, you can see her a little bit of her bedroom. Uh, wine bottles, of course, up in the, uh, in the cupboard on top of the refrigerator. Uh, I didn't include it, unfortunately, but there's like, I think there's a hot pot or some kind of like pressure cooker that's sitting on top of those shelves at the top left of this. And I thought that was funny because it's like, she's out with you. She's obviously, she's got takeout food and everything, but she could, she could make it if she wanted to, but I guess she doesn't. Um, and so we've got her with a martini and she's got a nice dress on and she's got a hoop, a hoop earrings, hoop earrings. Um, hashtag hoop, hoop earrings. Um, and so, you know, all is good. We're all, we're all happy. And, and this is how we communicate yet. She's got stubble on her legs. She's got her slippers on. She's got her shorts on, but she looks like she's presentable at least from the waist up. And I think that when he was doing this, when he was, uh, Adrian, when he was doing the illustration for this, uh, I think he meant to make this sort of, a a, 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 I guess an indictment, right? A, an illustration, a painting of how 2020 is. But inadvertently, he has sort of captured the life of the modern woman in this. And I say that because you see the cats around and the wine is over there and she's got a Marti it looks like a Cosmo or something's in her hand, right? And she's got her cell phone in her other hand. And remember, a lot of the, all this stuff is very symbolic. It's not like you just put this in here by accident. The toilet paper down there at the bottom uh, right uh, underneath the, sh the, the chair right there, that's not there by accident. That's there by design. And you can also see, you can also see the hand weights that are just sitting over there unused <laughs> uh, on the floor. Um, there's, uh, there's other little, it's almost like a Where's Waldo for the single woman of 2020. <laughs> And in some ways, like this has been passed around by by the likes of Dave, even Dave Rubin, I think, looked at this. I know Tim from uh, Tim Cast from Temple and and uh, and Lydia are Lydia. Is that what your name is? I'm sorry, Sour Patch Lydia. I think it's Lydia. Anyways, so it's an indictment on this this generation of women right here, and we don't really realize it. I think more people took it. In the terms of this is what women this you, you've arrived, ladies. I I, I tweeted when I first saw this, and I saw this not through Twitter. I saw this through my illustration because I I do digital illustration. I'm an art director. Blah blah blah. I saw this as sort of a a graph. You know, hey, look look at the cover of the was it the New York the New Yorker. The, and so I check it out and I go, wow. And I so I I picked this up. I made a screenshot of it and I put it out about two days ago on my own Twitter feed. And I said, "Congratulate!" Or what did I say? Rejoice, ladies! Um, you you finally arrived, or you've uh, you finally achieved your goals, right? Rejoice! Everything is done for you. There's no more no more accountability, no more judgment. Like Planet Fitness, right? Judgment free zone. There's no. Uh, let, me, let me get out of here. There's no more judgment. There's no more uh, accountability. There's no more liability. You do what you want. It's like 100% freedom. Do what you want. Girl. You go, girl. The world is your oyster. You can have it all. And this is this is having it all. This, <laughs> I got to put it back. This is having it all. That's you. 
that's that's the end result of that now of course you know i'm not trying to i'm not trying to be mr conservative tradcon right now because as you know i am i've been very i still am very critical of tradcon mentalities let's just say but there you have it and of course what happens is then red pill red quote unquote red pill women or the sun hat brigade decide that they want to pile on and say you know which way western woman is this what you really want do you not want babies there's another um Gosh, I wish I would have picked it up too. There's another, um, there's another illustration being passed around where it's like uh, it's uh, it's by the same illustrator, and in one panel it's the illustrator as a child, as as a, as a, as a young girl, and her mom that looks almost identical to her, and in that panel she's holding you know a baby she's got a, her brother and then her is there and they're smiling and I you know hey there's no dad of course in the in the, the, the Let's come back to that. But there's no dad, of course, in the picture. And in the next picture, it's like my mom. And then in the next one, it's me at 30, like my mom at 35 and me at 35. And her is with a glass of wine and, um, you know, kind of casual dress. No one else, just her glass of wine. And uh, she's got a, her luggage to go on whatever trip she's going on. Or it's her you know, doing something like, uh, what was the other one? There's two, there's a couple of them. That, that was the one that stuck in my head. I know there's another one where maybe she's like in a boardroom or something like that. And there is no children and there is no man in her life. And I think it's almost ironic that that's the, that's almost a badge of honor right now that the lack of, con of commitment really, but the lack of connection is something that women flaunt and are proud of and wave a flag over and there ain't no man here we don't need no man that's a what is it a, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle thank you gloria steinem that quote is from 1972 and we're still saying it today and we're still thinking that today and we're still wondering if women are ever going to be we're ever going to be free where are, are women ever going to have uh we're going to fight for our rights and every time i see that we're out there protesting for our rights what rights do you not have tell me that i can tell you rights that men don't have that you do have but i'm I, i'm confused as to what rights you think that you don't have that you need to be out in the streets with pink pussy hats on and and dressing up your allies in pink bras right is that that so what if you're going to make that that bold a statement you're going to have to back it up with like here's why i'm doing this and i would say 90 percent of the time women can't can't they couldn't tell you most people and i shouldn't pick on women because it's like most people who are out there can couldn't tell you why they're protesting and they don't have there's z they're not no they're not low information people they're like zero information it's like a party right it's like it's burning man let's go um but uh so I wanted to I wanted to point that out. I want to I wanted to lead off with that because the paternity thing that Aubrey has sort of that that's always a minefield and it doesn't matter it does not matter whether the woman is this flaming foaming at the mouth you know sea foam hair fuchsia hair you know lesbian uh, feminist it doesn't that that that's easy that's easy it's like when you see like someone like um, or when you listen to someone like Tommy Laren the empress has no clothes right she's very she's very proud she's very uh entitled she's very hubristic but she couldn't tell you why she could she doesn't she can't like parse that out for herself and most women can't still can't parse that out and so there's going to be women and i know that they're going to come into this particularly this conversation because they'll say well that's not what i want i really want babies and i can't find the right guy i really want a family and i can't find the right guy and I and and usually it comes back to a, um, a, de, a, a de, well a dependency on men for sure, but also responsibility of men. And I I've I've talked about that till I'm blue in the face with the, the difference between responsibility and authority. Something that will never be discussed on the Candace Owens show. That will never be discussed by Dana Lash. That will never be discussed by any conservative female talker out there because they don't want anything that could possibly come into that bubble and break it up and 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 shake up their their thinking about things it could they don't want that logic they don't want that reason they don't want those numbers that i just showed you they don't want that to come in because that is a threat to the revenue first of all but it's also a threat to their ego investments and everybody has ego investments i do you do everyone does 
to some degree we do. I try to stay as objective as I possibly can. And I, at least I understand that I do have them. <laughs> Most people don't. And particularly in this case, when women are acculturated and socialized to completely ignore the gynocentric social order, because it works in their favor. Why, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Why even analyze it? If it ain't broke, don't analyze it. So when I talk about, um, when I talk about unflattering facts about female nature or male nature for that matter too, because I get, I, it gets, comes from both sides. But when I talk about unflattering facts about women, then I get it not just from the liberal, you know, uh, you know, fuchsia haired baristas or the male allies. I also get it from conservatives, particularly from conservative women, because they don't want that. They don't want that data. They don't want, they want responsibility from it. Absolutely. That they think that's the cure. They think the cure to single momminess is men taking more responsibility. Well, great. The problem with that is they have no authority. Those guys who you're so proud of, the guys who are the, the guy, the stepdad, he's not the stepdad. He's the dad who stepped up that guy, the guy that you're with. Good job. Stepdad on, on father's day. Good job. <laughs> was it was, was that line from, uh, from whiplash where he says the two worst, the, 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 the worst two words in the English language are good job. <laughs> and, and it's true because it's like there it's, it, it means nothing at this point because you're just good job means thanks. You serve my interest. But in this case, it's like, it's like they, it, they don't want that coming into that. So they don't want something sort of breaking up that continuity, applying some sort of cognitive dissonance to think about why these things exist. Why did that happen? Why, why are we, why did we jump from this illustration, the, the thumbnail illustration? Why do we jump from this is about COVID and living in lockdown to this is an indictment of women in 2020. I, I would I would argue I wish I could I wish I could get the uh, the illustrator Adrian the guy he's illustrator I wish I could get him on here and see what his intent was when he did this because I don't think it was to say here's here's what happens here's what's happened to ladies it was just something that came out and that's it and women like oh oh yeah that's me and they can they it resonates with them and it resonates with them because it looks like them there's something there. There's something that's reflective of the, the the experience that they're going. Well, certainly for the last twenty, you know, for twenty twenty, but this is something that's that they they can identify with, and they laugh. Oh, there, that's me. Oh, look, I got stubble on my legs, and I'm, I'm drinking a Cosmo. Ha ha! I'm so fake. Ha ha! That's me. And they're proud of it, and they're oblivious to the the fact that they're proud of it, and that it, it just. But it's not. I mean, try to track with me here. It's not the fact that it was about COVID. It's that all we jump to seeing it as an indictment of women, an indictment of women in this, certainly going into the next decade. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute too. I'm going to talk about the rise of the she economy here in a little bit as well. This is, that's a, a, a research, well, a, a research project, I guess that Morgan Stanley did. And I think Forbes was also included in it. And it, is an advisory really to investors and businesses and stuff to sort of be prepared by 2030 to deal with women who are going to be single from the what the age cohort the marriageable women from 18 to 44 will be i, I believe it's above 50 percent, or it might be even as close as 55 or 58 percent. I'm, I'm off on my numbers right now but i know it's above 50 percent. will be single and childless in that cohort, 18 to 44. That doesn't mean they'll be like that forever, but they're saying that, that the the incidence of women being single and and for the most part never being married are are going to are going up exponentially right now. Why? We don't go. We we go. Oh well, I guess we're gonna just get prepared for it, and I'll 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 sell pink hammers and uh, I'll pink my guns and I'll pink this and I'll pink that so that I'm ready for to sell whatever my product is to women who are because we're gonna celebrate them for being single and independent and and professional and and just on top of their game. Well, you can plan ahead for the hey, good for you, uh, hustler. Go, you know, hate the game, don't hate the hustler, right? But we don't say why. And we don't see if, if why is a good thing or if why is something that is like detrimental to the human condition, right? We don't, we don't, we don't ask those questions. We don't ask why is it that 42% of children are born out of wedlock? We don't ask those questions. 
we just see it and we we just go with it or well we need more programs we need to support those poor women we need all oh, you bravo bravo superwoman you 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 raise these kids on your own and and you were just as good a father as you were a mother you can do it and and ladies if you're trapped in this thing it's not your fault it's the men's fault it's men's fault for not being responsible and this whole thing could be more uh, it could be just more, uh, we, we can resolve all of this if we could just simply get guys to take on more responsibility. That's not it. We don't give men the authority to enact that responsibility. End of story. That's it. We don't give men the authority to enact their, the responsibilities that we want to keep them beholden to to solve the problem, right? To say, well, we need, we need strong families. Okay, great. What are you going to do? And I, I, I'm not going to go all turf flinging monkey on you here, but like he's going to like, I'm sure that I know that the MGTOW sort slash black pill doom pill answer is, well, take away their votes, take away their rights. That ain't going to happen. We need to find another solution. How do we, where do we go? How do we, how do we make it work from here? Because it's, what we're doing ain't working. And we're, it's, you know, as far as we can prognosticate, it doesn't look good. You want, you can say, well, I'm going to enjoy the decline. Good. Well, guess what? You're going to get to the end of the decline at some point. And then what are you going to do? No, well, I enjoyed my time. Bye. <laughs> no, you're not going to do that. You're going to be stuck in the decline or what, what's the result of that decline. You can insulate yourself. Sure. You can prepare for it. Sure. You can do the best that you can do for yourself. Sure. But in the meantime, generation after generation, that still buys into this crap. That still buys into the idea that men should sell out, sell out their innate interests in their own paternity. That. You want to, I'll, I'll just give you the brief answer to this right now. You want to know why we have, Aubrey, if you're watching, this is why you're confused. This is what you don't get. It's not the post facto rationalizations of all this. Well, we're more human than that. We want to make sure that the babies are taken care of, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, okay. How about this? How about we prevent those babies from being born in the first place? And I don't mean abortion. I mean, taking ladies, taking some responsibility for yourself and not having those kids. You're the one who are, who is in charge of the pregnancy. And if you don't believe me, go look at any, I don't know, congressional hearing, Senate hearing about abortion, because the first thing out of women's mouths is, well, it's my uterus. You don't have a say in it. Okay. If I don't have a say in it, then guess what? It's on you to take responsibility for that uterus that I don't have a say about. That's it. So here we go. The reason why we have this, you know, this epidemic, let's just say, of 42% of children being born out of wedlock is because we've empowered women to, to pretty much make it, <laughs> we, we, we've empowered them to tell men that their, their interest in their own paternity doesn't matter. That women's uh, mating strategy is the preeminent social, socially correct direction that we should be going in as a species right now. And I don't mean that just in the United States, Western, cult, uh, Western countries that we are exporting, uh, we're exporting Western culture to right now. Eventually, we're going to get there. We're already there right now, just by, you know, by inch or by mile, we're there by now. But the thing is, is that we have done this at least since the 1970s. Where we say, uh, you're, he's not the stepdad, he's the dad who stepped up. It shouldn't matter. Like real men, real men should, uh, should date single mothers. Real men should uh, take care. It doesn't matter who the kid is. I've seen Twitter feeds and, and, and forum feeds where women are saying, or, or a guy, uh, remember the kid that I, oh, forget the guy that I, I, I did the, the video show on, the, the black guy that I did, um, where he wasn't the father of the child. And the what and the and the girl was trying to the pregnant girl was trying to get him. What the heck was his name? Somebody give me the name. I know it's in there. It's in my it's in my archives. But he still wanted to step up, even though the kid wasn't his. He she tried to put one past him, and it wasn't his. And it's like it, it, it's that's the mentality. That's where we go as guys. We think that it's our like our good Christian duty. To, to step up and do those things, to take care of it. Like, well, that guy was a failure. L listen to what Dana Lash said. That guy was a failure. My, my biological father was a failure. Well, guess what? That failure, your mom knocked it out with that failure. Your mom chose that guy on some, for some reason. For, she, was, she was hot for him, and, and that was the, that's how it went. Or unless you're Dana Lash, unless your father, your biological father, raped your mom, I don't see that there's, there's still an element of 
who's getting with who, right? Oh, he didn't want his responsibilities. <gasps> well, okay, maybe, maybe he just simply didn't want to deal with your mom's bullshit. Maybe he didn't want to deal with that. Maybe there was something else that was going on. Who knows? You'll never know because your mom's never going to give you a straight story about that because you're too happy with your stepdad. You're too happy with the guy who was the beta bucks guy who walked in and took over the situation. That's why. Not because you want to know a oh, Jay Cook. Thanks for that, uh, Sam. Jay Cook was the guy that I was talking about. He was like, he was a kid. What is he? 19, 20, maybe he's 21. Um, uh, black kid who did a video that was trending on, on, on uh, YouTube about what, three months ago, four months ago. And uh, it turns out that he, the, the girl who told him that the baby was his, he did the DNA testing and maybe this is staged, who knows, but the, the story goes this way is that um, did the DNA testing, found out that the, the daughter was not his. He'd already emotionally sort of invested himself in this. He'd done all these videos, like I'm going to be in the delivery room and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And he was, he was the child's father. He believed that he was the child's father. Turns out what about a year later, maybe she, I think she was one years old or maybe she was like eight months old or something like that, found out that the kid's not his. And got and rightly so got really pissed off at being deceived about that because that's not the kind of deception like i stole a hundred bucks from you that's i stole your life from you that's what that is but even under those that that degree of severity the guy's like i, I also want to be part of her life okay so we, like we go what the heck? like and from a third party we got like this is why aubrey huff doesn't understand stuff like this you go, why, why on earth would you want to do that? Well, because he comes from a generation that has been conditioned to think that it's his response. It should be his responsibility, that he's going to step up. He's going to be a real man. You get the manhood badge. You get the manhood merit badge, the medal, if you do these things. That's a dream come true, man. She, I would say that the, 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 I don't know what the name of the girl was, but like whatever her name was, the mother of the child was probably like, well, why did I, why did I do any of this? Why didn't I just tell him I cheated on him? Because he's that big of a chump that he's going to invest himself parentally in another man's child. And there are forums where women are saying, well, if you really loved her, it wouldn't matter who the kid was. It wouldn't matter that she cheated on you. You would just, your love conquers all. No, it doesn't. But, <laughs> but what you're saying essentially in a preemptive say, like, remember how I talk post facto or pre facto. So the pre facto thing is this, is that when we talk about hypergamy, when we talk about women, alpha seed, beta need, um, and no other time in human history has it been easier for women to facilitate that than today. And that's why you see women in COVID lockdown who have no man because they have pretty much used up all of the agency that they've had from the time they were 22, 23, 24 years old, all the way up until they're 35, whatever it is, and have not been able to consolidate or settle or in any way figure out or have the insight or the humility, let's just say, to say, you know what, I, I want to get with a guy I want, I'm, you know, break that programming. There's a blue pill for women. And it's called feminism, first of all, but there's a blue pill for women. And that blue pill is you go, girl. It's all yours. Everything's yours. That's why I said the victory of the modern woman. You've won. What are you going to do with all this power, ladies? Where are you going to take it? What are you going to do from here? Well, according to the cover of the uh, New Yorker, not much. <laughs> you know, show off online and get, the, get your positive strokes from OnlyFans or whatever your social media is, but not much. Not much else from that. And so prior to this, we have to look at women's mating strategy as to why paternity is a big deal for guys and why, why, uh, why we need to make it a social imperative for men to believe that it doesn't matter who the kid's father is. It doesn't matter if you're, this, you're not a stepfather, you're the dad who stepped up, right? It doesn't matter. In fact, you're more of a man because you're the guy that actually took the responsibility from the guy that she chose to breed with in the first place. So to me, I don't know about you guys, from an objective God's eye observation of this. It seems to me that she's just basically uh, fulfilled and consolidated on her mating strategy. She bred with the hottest guy she could get with, and she got with the guy who's the best provider, the most parental invested guy, the guy who was, what are the three Ps? Protection, provisioning, and parental investment. That's, that's why you see, that's why guys are like, what's, what's with the single mommy thing right now? Why do I feel, why do I get run up the flagpole? as Rich Cooper, as Aubrey Huff, as Rolla Tomasi, as whoever, when I say, guys, don't date single moms. 
you, if you uh, wait about three more months and then tweet that out and see if that goes viral. I guarantee it always guaranteed to go viral. Uh, that and what Rich is, Rich is, uh, here's six things women can do to make themselves more feminine and more appropriate and more attractive to men. How dare you? And it will go on and on and on and on because we are conditioned as, in Western culture and gynocentric culture to prioritize women's mating strategy, to prioritize their life strategy, to prioritize lifting that, to pedestalize women. Like we always say like, in, like, we, we, I'm not a PUA, but I know that like guys in the game communities and the PUA side of things, they get run up the flagpole for saying, uh, or, or even, I guess even MGTOWs would say this, like, don't pedestalize your, don't pedestalize her, knock her off the pedestal. That, okay. That's great. What you really need to start with is knock womankind off the pedestal. Stop holding that, holding women up to this goddess level of res default respect, unearned, unmerited default respect, and start looking at the mechanics behind the behavior. The medium is the message. Great. What is the message? What is the message of her behavior? What is the message of that social contract? What it, or social uh, or the social convention? What is the the message of what is happening? How do we get to that point? Let's let's go back and look and and look under the hood. Let's reverse engineer this and see what happened and why do we get to where we're at right now? So when we get to uh when, when we talk about how guys should accept, like we, I would say really since the sexual revolution, we have institutionally and socially through church, through popular culture, through psychology, through Oprah, through Dr. Phil, through whatever popular medium that you can think of that will uh, socialize or acculturate people, even down to our family, like for, for four generations, we have taught men that your paternity is worthless. It doesn't matter when a woman has uh, when a woman says, ah, I'm not going to take your last name or she hyphenates her last name. People wonder why I freak out on that. I'm not freaking out on that. I'm pointing it out. And that's what I, I hold up a mirror, man. I just work here. So when I when I go and I, I say, here's a here's a here's a like, I'll say this. Like, what was it? Uh, what the heck was her name? Uh, Tori, Tori Clark, something or other. It's a, a, a hyphenated last name. I always like will point out that there's a, a hyphen right there. And the reason for that hyphen, and this is me again, okay, because I, I realize in some other cultures it might be a little bit different, but I think the the rise in the tendency for women to want to keep their last names, Candace Owens, um, I want, I think that one of the reasons that they do that is because they don't want to have that sense of ownership. They don't want to be owned. I think feminists certainly certainly recognize that. They don't. They want to keep their last names, or you'll get some chump who says, "Well, I'll take your last name. We're living in a modern society." What you're doing, gentlemen, when you do that, when you when you uh, surrender your last name, you're you're only first of all, you're only confirming your beta ness, your your low value, your low status to her when you don't insist on that. Now you say, well, what are you talking about, Rolo? That's crazy. That's crazy talk. Well, she doesn't want your shitty genetics, is what she's saying. That's that's the basis of the thing. Because there is for for men, you have to understand that paternity means something that's that's a whole lot different than it does to women. Because for men, men have to be able to find some. Up until like we had DNA testing, you had to find some way to ensure that the child was yours. Because for men, our mating strategy is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. And if you don't believe me, go look at all. Go look at porn. There it is. That, why is porn such a big deal for guys? Why is it? Why is it an addiction today? Why is it free? Why is it ubiquitous online? Blah blah blah. You've heard me talk about that all the time. Unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. What that means is that I, spread the seed. It's our selection, right? Let's let's go and have sex with as many. That's that's an efficient mating strategy for men. Just get it out there, like like fire hose it, right? <laughs> that's that's an efficient mating strategy for men. The problem with that is that at some that doesn't it's not a very efficient mating strategy for males and females because you have to have some sort of parental investment in the child itself because if you don't the species dies out because human beings have great big heads and they have to go through a birth canal and they have they're basically helpless when they come out of the out of the womb and they have to be raised to tell at least somewhat self-sufficiency so to do that there has to be sort of a basis of support that's what makes us kind of tribalistic. That's what makes us sort of so well. It certainly makes us social animals, but um, that's why women have to choose the right guy with whom to breed. Who is going to be the best balance between genetic benefits and provisioning benefits or survival benefits? So when 
when women are making that choice, that's what I call the hypergamous filter. I just go through that really quickly. But the other part of this is that because of that, men have to make a trade-off. We have to abandon our mating strategy to invest in one woman, in one single, one single, at least for a time anyways. Uh, you know, after a while you go, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go find somebody else. Or the best mating strategy actually is for guys. And this is straight out of mystery method. I know is to look for a woman who is sort of your main, or you got two mains and you got concubines on the side. That's the sign of a path of, of a, what that used to be the sign of a powerful man. I guess kind of today it still is, it is a guy who can get with a lot of women that is you, that used to be a status symbol, but it also came with a commensurate level of responsibility. So you couldn't just like go out and bang willy nilly. You had to take care of your concubines. You had to take care of your wives. You had to invest in them in some way in that bad implied responsibility. The problem with that is, is that by doing that, by, especially when it comes to, um, uh, socially enforced monogamy by doing that, you are, uh, there's, there's a cost well, there's a cost to, uh, was it cost efficiency balance or something? So I forget the, the actual proper name of it, but there's a, uh, uh, a cost to risk balance with that or opportunity cost. That's what it is in investing in one woman. Because if you're invested in that woman, that means there's dozens and dozens of other women that you could be impregnating that you're not because you're forsaking all others and you're focusing on this, on this, just this one. That's a compromise. You're compromising your sexual strategy for her. And the deal in marriage is that she's supposed to do the same thing, forsaking all others and to not cuckold you. Well, now cuckoldry is really part of society. I'm sorry to say, but it, like, when we talk about single dads and single moms and and you know, blended families, but you're essentially just normalizing cuckoldry is what it is. And the only sex that cuckoldry advantages is women. That's it. No, there are no cuckoldry because unless until guys are giving birth, there is no cuckoldry for guys. Because when women give birth, like the, the, the one part of that arrangement, the one part of that compromise, the guy says, okay, I'm going to forsake all of these dozens of women that I could be with, whether that's true or not makes it is irrelevant. He thinks he is, or that would be his choice if he could get it. But I'm going to forsake all others and be with you. The only deal breaker is the kid's got to be mine. Because if it's not, then my whole life and my genetics don't go on to the next generation and I'm screwed, right? That, that's my genetic, my evolutionary impulse, my evolutionary drive is to reproduce and to ensure that my genetics make it on into the next generation. That's from an evolutionary innate level of thinking. What this new war on paternity does is it convinces guys that that paternity is worthless. That investment in paternity is worthless. You want to know why guys mate guard, why guys get jealous, why guys get possessive ladies? It's because they want to know the kid is theirs. Why does a guy get suspicious and, fl and flip through your phone to see if you're talking to some other dude? Because he wants to know that you're a good bet for his future paternity. That's why. That's why you, that's why when, when, when women go, oh, I can't believe that guys don't want to get with me because I'm a single mom, blah, blah, blah. Well, because you have an outward expression of the fact that you are not a good bet for paternity for that guy. You've already proved it. You've got a guy, you've got a child from another man. And so now the deal is this, I'll take care of that guy's sprog and I'll ha only have sex with you and no one else. And, uh, hopefully you'll be able, hopefully we'll be able to breed too. And I'll have a kid with you as well. But, the, but you're, you're adding one more stipulation to that, that, social contract, which is I not only take care of my kids, your kids, but the guy that you thought was a good idea to breed with before I walked in the door. That's the, and, and, and in a gynocentric social order, women go, yeah, that sounds great. That would make you a real man to, to, to put that jealousy away, to put that parental investment away, to put that, that, put that, 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 like, um, I mean, obsessive, evolutionary, innate interest in your own paternity. Take that and turn that off, Mr. Beta Male, because this is a great deal for you. That's what, the, and we've institutionalized it. We've socialized it. We tell men that they're real men for that. So that that's where I'm going with this. And hopefully I'll be able to talk about this with, with uh, Aubrey tomorrow. Let me, uh, let me catch up on some of these uh, super chats. I'm going to try to, because I know you guys are going to have lots and lots of these today. Oh, sorry, man. Dang it. I should have, I should have picked up on that quicker. Uh, blue collar mindset says brought, uh, bought all of the, bought all three audio books. I think, damn man. Thanks for the 50 bucks, brother. Um, books listened to them five times a piece. Oh, cool. I hope you like my reader 
Sambada because he's the guy that's in the chat modding right now. Uh, watched all your solo podcasts, just o- ordered all three books in paperback. So when the world ends, <laughs> I'll have them in physical form. This is all, uh, this is for all the priceless wisdom. Thanks. I would gain. Uh, thanks, Rolo. You are welcome, Blue Collar Mindset. Thank you for doing that. And you are going to be buying a fourth one very soon. Uh, Spin Doctor said, Spin Doctor says, off topic, uh, you pick great images. Thank you. Uh, I try to. I, yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll give you a really quick aside story because I know you guys hate it when I go off on tangents. But um, one, of the, one of my job duties for a long time, like when I was an art director, I still am an art director, but when I was, um, when I was a brand manager, a graphic designer, art director, uh, part of my job duties was to be a photo editor. And so I, I'm I'm an artist as it is, but like, I think I have a pretty good eye for photos and things that are sort of like, like, like they say, what I, uh, a picture tells a thousand stories or something like that. Was that a thousand words, right? So I'm, that's why I do what I do. Uh, Joe AM says, Rolo heard you and Sam Bada on that female. That was Jay. Uh, what was that? Uh, oh, what the heck's her name? Um, is it Jay? Jay is for justice. That's what it is. Um, I might go on her show again. I don't know. Uh, I, we're, we're setting it up. I might be on that one again. Joe said this. He said, uh, Rolo, you uh, heard you on that show with Sam Bada, a uh, female YouTube channel recently. Excellent work as always paying it forward to guys who are unplugging and need to be unplugged. Thank you, Joe, for that kind word. And you are 99 bucks. Damn, brother. Thank you. Um, I, I went on, um, I went on a podcast called Jay is for justice. You can go look it up. Uh, she's actually, she's got a pretty decent sub count. I mean, she's in the 40 thousands, right? Um, but anyways, I went on there. Um, I wish I could have stayed on longer. I, I just sort of went on there cause Sam uh, said, Hey, you got to come on this show. So I talked with her and her co-host who I think her name was Dre <laughs> and, um, and then two other ladies that were on there as well. It's, it was kind of interesting to be uh, Roll Tomasi, the only male in the hat. Well, I guess Simon was on, but be Roll Tomasi in uh, all female show, which was was funny. Like people ask me all the time, they say, "Are you going to have women on your show?" Um, I don't know. Do you want me to? <sighs> I try not to because I run into the same problem that I. And this actually kind of goes back to what we're talking about today. Is like Jay was Jay, at least she wants to sit there and she wants to listen. She'll, she'll say, okay, let's listen to what he has to say. Kind of thing. That's to me, that's kind of rare for most women, but for other women, like one of the girls that was on there, it's like when you say something that sort of triggers an emotional response, it sort of shuts down the conversation. And that's why like people ask me, well, how come you don't talk to, to women or I have, I have posts actually, I, I linked one in here. There, I have a post that is a dedicated essay for women. Um, just because it says the rational male doesn't mean women can't go pick it up and learn from it and read from you read from my books. Certainly this last, the, the fourth one. But, uh, I, I think, I think people think that I'm like anti-female or something. I'm not anti-female, but I just, I, I pick my battles, right? I don't want to waste your time as a listener. And I don't want to waste my time as just trying to convince somebody of something that they're just, you can't teach people who don't want to be taught. So, and again, it also comes back to the emo- it, We live in the age of emotion. So emotion and feelings trump everything. Feels before reals trumps everything. So when I, for instance, show you guys stats of something, uh, that feels bad. Well, let's talk about it. Why does it make you feel bad? I don't want it. It just makes me feel bad. All right. Well, the end of that conversation. Let's move on to the next podcast. <laughs> Uh, Diane Rubio says, when it comes to submitting to, uh, the authority of a man, how is it possible for a woman to operate from her own mental point of origin? Okay. Um, Diane, I talked about this a little bit. Um, when I talked to, <laughs> I talked to Sterling Cooper, male porn star extraordinaire, uh, Sterling Cooper. I talked to him on Monday on his Monday show. I was on there for about 90 minutes and we talked about exactly this. Um, we talked about solipsism. So when, when I refer to mental point of origin, I'm, I'm usually generally talking to guys because guys are the ones who get conditioned from an early age to make women and womankind on a pedestal, right? To make that their mental point of origin, to make, to be serviceable, to be sacrificed, to be sacrificial, um, and to, to basically be powerless because in my book, power isn't about like controlling other people. It's the amount of control you have over your own life. And what people exercise over the control of that, whether you allow them to, or you don't, you know, or you're in circumstances you can control, you can't, that's, we can, we can talk about that, but power itself 
is the power you have of making the choices that you want to to do the things that you want to. And so when it comes for when it comes to like women in authority for men, like the the problem I think that women have when I use the term authority is they think of it in tyrannical terms. We think of patriarchy as a an in, uh, inherently tyrannical social order. So when I look at like patriarchy, I look at it in terms of being a balanced system. And I, I know I'm you know, all credit to TFM for this, but patriarchy is a balanced system and it is the natural out, out the natural extension of our gender roles, our innate gender roles as what we are as, as men and what we are as women and how our brains work and how our bodies work. Uh, and then also how our psychology works, how our emotions and our instinct and our reason works as well. So under patriarchal social orders, it was balanced. Ideally, it was balanced. I didn't say it's, it's, I'm not saying it's perfect, but ideally, patriarchy is a much more balanced system than gynocentrism because gynocentrism only focuses on one sex. Patriarchy focuses on the whole. So when a guy is the head of the household or you, you hear about a headship in religions, like I talked about last Sunday, when you hear about how men are the are the ones who are going to be the directors of the family and it, what they say goes and they're the captain of the ship and blah 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 well, whatever you want to like whatever your pastor is feeding you right now um there was an in, implied authority that for all of the responsibility we expect men to assume that they have this authority to affect that the what they have to do to be responsible to be respectable and responsible so when, when I talk about authority right now, patriarchy used to balance responsibility with male authority. So now men are responsible for kids, and in some cases, kids that aren't even their own. If they want to be men, they have to take on as much responsibility as possible, but they also have to defer to women's authority. They have to say, okay, lady, oh, you know, uh, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If mama ain't happy, God ain't happy. Uh, it was a happy wife, happy life. That's not, that's, by the way, that's not folk wisdom. That's an ultimatum. <laughs> it is now, but we presume there's still this old order thinking or this old uh, social contract where we still believe this is that men have authority, that they've got that. They can do what they, they can do those things. No, they don't. In fact, the state, a gynocentric state has ensured that men will never have authority and they have far less authority over their lives or the power over their lives when they're married as opposed to when they are single. It's like the, I, I mentioned this in book four. There was a an old law that was called the uh, the Coventry law, or Coventry law, I think is what it was, for women in the Victorian era. And so when women tell you that, well, well women couldn't own property, no, 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 no. Women could absolutely own property. They could they could inherit property. They could they could be the director of a, they could own a business. They could do all kinds of things as long as they were single. They had more power unmarried than they did when they were married because what happens is once that under Coventry laws of the 18, I believe it was the 1800s, um, they lost all of that because the control of those assets uh, defaulted to the husband. And the reason they did that is because they presumed that the husband was the one who was going to be, and remember this is, this is marriage for like upper middle class to upper class people in society. And this is in, uh, this is both in uh, Europe, England, and the United States. And, the reason they did that is because there was a presumption that the guys would have their own investments or they would have their own businesses or they didn't want the business that the woman had inherited from her, like maybe her father or whatever, her family or the property that she'd inherited. They didn't want that woman to be able to say, okay, I'm going to sell that or I'm going to make a bad business decision or I'm going to make an emotional decision about the, the, the employees or I'm going to make a decision about whatever that's going to affect his property or because once that woman becomes his his wife, any decisions that she makes, he's legally bound to. And that's why that worked out. So it's not like, like men were like, Oh, I'm going to cuff, going to put handcuffs on her and chains and walk her around like the Hebrews in Egypt. That's no, that's not what happened. But the comparison I make in book four is this, is that under those old Coventry laws, that's women had more power and more direction over their lives when they were single than when they were, when they were married. Same thing applies now to men. Men have more direction and more, they, you have more authority over your life as a single man than you will over your life as a, as a married man right now. Those are, and I can show you the stats. I can show you everything. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a million MGTOWs that are ready to back me up on that too. Now, I don't think that that's the ideal situation, but 
the authority thing is, is this is women presume that guys have authority because they think that we still live in that patriarchal tyranny that they've been taught by Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan and all these, all the early militant feminists who were influential in this gynocentric social order that still say, well, men have a, or women have a long way to go, baby. They're still using the same jargons and jingos and whatever from, from the seventies. And we still, we I don't give me more, <laughs> you know, that, and because we can't think of it, it's, it's in book four, I call it old order thinking and women, when it, particularly when it comes to women's liberation and feminism, that's most definitely where they default to. Um, but so when it comes to like, how does a woman submit to his authority? That's the problem. You, the reason why you're even asking me this is because you pr were probably acculturated, most likely from what I can tell, it looks like you were uh, acculturated in a post-sexual revolution generation. So we, we don't like most women d think that men already have that authority and, or else like, and I've heard pastors say, this is like, ladies, you need to let your man or your husband lead. You need to allow him to lead. Remember, uh, what was it? Uh, Andrew Yang, Andrew Yang said something like, oh, my wife let me run for president because of this issue or something like that, or allowed me to run for president. And I, I drew a lot of attention to that. I go, yeah, because you're beholden to your wife. So she's the one with the, I, I use that as a, as a real good example of female authority that was sort of like implicit authority. Ah, she allowed me to, she allowed me to run because of this one issue, or I allowed him to run because of the, allowed, let, permission, allowed him to do these things. Who has the authority in that? Who, who has the presumed authority in that sentence? And guys don't even think about that. Women don't even think about that. Well, I wear the pants in this house. <laughs> he thinks he's the boss. You know, we put cutesy little sayings on the wall or whatever. You can pink it up and put like little fuzzy slippers on it, but it's still the same thing as men don't do not have authority. And if you ever want to test that, all you have to do is call the police and say, my husband is, is being verbally abusive. Who gets taken from the house? You or him? Him. And always will be him. That's, that's the easy one. That's the easy. That's uh, there's other ways that, that women exercise authority over men and men don't even realize it. Men actually, uh, will accept being sublimated and and that 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 authority that women have is also implicit in the man's thinking himself because when we think about uh and, you know equal partnerships or egalitarian marriages or whatever oh we're playing equal partners we're we're egalitarian there's no such thing as e an equal relationship there's no such thing as an egalitarian relationship for human beings on planet earth there is no such thing I don't care if you're male, you're female. I don't care if you're, you're homosexual. There's always a sub and a dom. Go look at a, go look at Ellen page, man. She, she didn't want to be a sub anymore. She decided she wanted to be a dom. She decided she wanted to be masculine. There's always a masculine and there's always a feminine, even in homosexual relationships. There's always, uh, you know, women keep saying, oh, I want a man who's my, my equal. No, you don't. You want a guy who's bigger than you, stronger than you, taller than you, hotter than you, makes more money than you, more intelligent than you. Because if he wasn't, you wouldn't want to have babies with him. That's how I programming works. Please just get that in your head. Okay. Uh, Matthew Magda says, uh, psychologically, why do we find baby animals cute? Uh, it's called neoteny. Go look that word. N-E-O-T. Neoteny. I, I don't know how to spell it. Neoteny. Neoteny. Uh, what's the evolved benefit for finding baby ducklings, bunnies, greyhounds? <laughs> yeah. Greyhounds. Baby greyhounds. Go look them up. Uh, endearing. It's called neoteny. It is an investment we have in, uh, and remember, it's in cute animals. We don't, we don't have neoteny about like baby lizards. Usually, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're getting past. Maybe, maybe we're evolving. <laughs> we don't have neoteny about. Uh, we don't have neoteness, neoteny when it comes to like baby spiders, right, <laughs> or snakes, right. I don't know. Maybe you do, but that would be a little off. But when it comes to cute, fuzzy little things with big eyes and little ears and little noses, that's because it reminds us of human babies. That's why. Go look it up. That's actually a psychological thing that humans are uh, a part of. Uh, what was this one here? There wasn't actually a. There it is. Uh, what do you say? Maki says, I started listening to you recently after my heartbreak, uh, and you make sense in all perspectives. Well, thank you. I hope you got over your heartbreak. There is no one. Go read that one a couple times. Go read that and soulmate myth. Giga Chad actual says, uh, you prophetically spoke of open cuckoldry in book three. Do you think this will be uh, state enforced post COVID <laughs> state enforced? 
No, it doesn't need. Yeah, I'll tell you why, because it doesn't need to be. Why, why enforce something when you can just encourage people to do it often enough and they'll do it. It's like, was it uh, Joseph Goebbels, right? Repeat a lie often enough and it becomes true. Well, you repeat uh, a narrative often enough and people will take it as a value. People will adopt it as folk wisdom. They'll adopt it as an aphorism. There's your, that's your vocabulary word. Go look up for aphorism. It's a truism. It's, um, it's something that is like sort of poetically true, right? If you say that often enough and it's bullshit, people will take it as like some kind of folk wisdom. So why would they, why, why would anybody take polyandry? Like the thing is, is like, we're already doing that, man. Open cuckoldry is not, it doesn't need to be stated for us. If it, if it was, people might like, got, people might go, Oh, that's a little weird. And already it is kind of state enforced because right now the father of a child is pretty much whoever the woman writes on the birth certificate. And unless you have suspicions, unless you demand that DNA test, which is really difficult to do in some States and in, in many countries, Unless you go and do that, you're never going to find out and you are going to be the one who is going to be financially responsible for a child that you that doesn't have any of your DNA in it. And now that we have like genomic testing, we we pretty much mapped the human genome and we have DNA testing and all this other good stuff. Uh, hell, even 23andMe is revealing a lot of we're, we're seeing just how much higher the, you know, what I call proactive cuckoldry rate is as opposed to retroactive cuckoldry rate. Proactive cuckoldry is you married her and she went out and banged, uh, what is it? Kevin in sales, <laughs> the hot guy in the phone can apart. No, no, Kevin in sales and, um, got pregnant and said, the baby's yours because Kevin was hot and he was fun. It was, you know, I was drunk. He was cute. And one thing led to a number, another, but Kevin's dirt poor in sales. So I want to go, I want to make sure this guy pays for Kevin's baby. Okay. So that's proactive cuckoldry. Retroactive cuckoldry is this. She banged the hot guy in the foam cannon party. Um, and she, uh, has what three babies with two different guys when you've waltz in and you're, you're the guy who steps up. That's retroactive cuckoldry. That is also why I will never go on Joe Rogan because the minute I bring that up, he will punch me in the face. <laughs> And you know, I'm, you, you know, I'm right. You know, I'm right. I, I'm going there for the, I'm going there. I'm not going to Joe Rogan for the interest of keeping my gorgeous face in one piece. By the way, I don't have it with me right today, but, um, I'm going to do, I might do, uh, one endorsement or two endorsements. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe, maybe a permanent thing. But uh, I'm not an affiliate, but I might do an endorsement for uh, Devil Mountain Coffee. So if you guys are into good coffee, that is sort of like uh, <laughs> microbrew <laughs> is, uh, you know, uh, I think Devil Mountain is pretty good. I, they have tried their stuff. It's really high octane coffee. So beware. <laughs> it is like the highest caffeine count uh, count you can get in a coffee. And uh, I'll, I'll probably by Sunday I'll have some. So I'll, I'll tell you what happened. What else? What else? What else? Gosh, I guess. Okay. I guess I'm going to, to these right now. Uh, young single Rolo today does what? Go cheers. Okay. Young single Rolo. Young single Rolo in 2020. How young? <laughs> How young am I? Am I in my twenties? <laughs> I hate these questions, Digi, because they're usually like people say, well, what would you tell your 19 year old self? my 19 year old self would tell me to go fuck off. That's what would happen. I would, they would be, I would 19 year old Rolo would be like, get out of here. Old man. Like I, I would totally understand why, why the youth of today still, especially now because you, the youth of today have more access to information and more access to things that I did not have access to way back in the day that I can have right now. But now I'm like, well, like for instance, you see a new guitar in the back here every once in a while. It's like, yeah, I collect guitars occasionally, but, um, I can remember a time where like this one right here, that took me like probably six months to save up the money for that. When I was 21, I've had that guitar for a long time. Um, and so the, I think that the, the experience of like gaining things is a lot different now for guys like there was no rational mail there was no internet there was no there wasn't even any cell phones or certainly wasn't smartphones so you had to figure things out a lot more yeah i think you had to be a little bit more um 
spontaneous. Uh, you had to improvise differently. You had to learn things trial and error. Sometimes you could really hurt yourself, right? But um, I think that's the difference today. I think that right now, if I had a, if I had advice for like younger people today, uh, well, first of all, don't get married. That's number one. Not until things change. It's not that I don't. It's not that I think uh, people keep saying you're you're down on marriage. I'm not down on marriage. Uh, I've been married for 24 years, going on 25 right now. I love my wife to death. I have a 40 plus notch count prior to that. I've lived a pretty, pretty good life when it comes to when it comes to my sex life and my personal life and stuff. Um, yeah, I've had ups and downs. Are, are there women I regret meeting? Oh, sure. <laughs> but um, I I think that right now guys are too, I'll say scatterbrained, but we're too distracted by different things. Uh, if you want to really if you want to live kind of, if you want to change your life, if you want to unlearn some things like remove distractions and guys always say, uh, you'll hear this from like success gurus all the time. You need to be focused. Well, how do you do that? Well, take up something that requires your 100% concentrated focus. I always, I say, I say music is one of those things. Like right now, even now I, you know, me being 52 years old, um, when I play music in the band, I'm in, man, I, I, I have nothing else. Turn everything else off. I, I don't, there's two or three places I don't take my cell phone or I don't really like like to to use my cell phone if that I don't take my cell phone into the gym I never take my cell phone in the gym and I know everybody's in between their sets that that is not a workout man that's just you just killing time don't take your cell phone into the gym uh, I mean people say well what about music I need to have my music well then get an iPod or get something else I don't know I, I know people use their their Bluetooth and stuff like that but don't take it. Don't take a, don't take your cell phone in there. Don't be eliminate that distraction. If there's one place that you don't take your cell phone, it should be the gym, even church, right? I mean, you go to church. Yeah. Well, you turn everyone, turn your cell phone or the movie theaters, right? You still take your, your phone in there, but you turn it off. Okay. Because you're focused on one thing. You're paying attention to the movie that you just paid for. Uh, I think that same thing should apply to guys when you go to the gym. The other thing is whenever I'm walking my dogs, don't call me because I will not have my phone with me. I do not take my phone with me when I'm walking my dogs. I do my best thinking when I'm when I'm at the gym, when it's two in the morning and I wake up to take a piss, and when I'm walking my dogs. So I don't I don't take that my my distractions go away. But I think that other than that, I'm multitasking constant. I'm multitasking right now, um, and I'm trying to pay attention to you guys. Uh, but there, I think focusing on one thing is sort of a lost art right now, and I really think that that's how human beings really learn mastery for a while is being sort of single-minded about things. So, uh, Jay is for justice. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, if, uh, Jay wants to do something on Saturday, Sam, let her know. I'll, if she's not watching right now, um, I'll, I'll see if I can do it. We, we can do it Saturday evening, I guess. Uh, what else is here? Let's see if I can back up a little bit. Sorry guys. I don't mean to stall out the show. Okay. I guess I have to go back this way. Uh, ladies, uh, this is Scott. Colopitz? What a what a last name, my friend. Uh, ladies and gents, let's appreciate Tom Likas in his final form. Who me? No, I you know what I whenever I put my I have I have these fishing glasses, these polarized fishing glasses. Whenever I put them on, they look like Tom Likas' old glasses because he always wears like uh, sunglasses. And people say, Oh man, are you like are you like Tom Likas' love child? No, 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 really. I should do that. I should, I should go knock on Tom's door and say, Tom, I'm your son. <laughs> uh, Christian Matico says, a contribution from the church as always. Thank you. Christian Matico, Matico, Automatico. Uh, Jason, the dream gave me five bucks. Thank you, my friend. Joe Flegel, Flegel says, I see an increase, or an increasing amount of men entering into relationships with pansexual, non-gender bi women. How many? <laughs> an increasing number. <laughs> well, it went from 10 to 12. That's an increasing number. <laughs> Do you see this as an increasing market trend or a fad otherwise? No, I don't see it at, at this stage, no. But I do see an increase in the idea that we're supposed to, as heterosexual men, accept that we're supposed to be aroused by and attracted to everything I don't know, whatever. And the reason for that is because we're supposed to accept social constructionism when it comes to gender issues. We're, we're expected to, to uh, actually, that's not, uh, that's not a half bad question. I'm sorry. I don't mean to, to, to belittle you for, for there for a second. But what I mean is this, is that 
when I was talking about pay, uh, uh, paternity and how men have an innate interest in paternity, and man, I, I, I'm blowing my best stuff because I really want to talk about this with Aubrey and maybe Rich tomorrow. But when it comes to paternity, one of the things that women in that thread that I was talking to uh, with, with Aubrey about, one of the reasons why modern women don't get it is because their their interests, their their revenue interests, their life interests, their emotional interests are invested in them not getting it, in them perpetuating the idea that guys are heroes for stepping up and taking over for the genetic responsibility of the guy that they thought was hot in Cancun on spring break in the foam cannon party. That's that's the that's the bound that's the that's the trick man that's the plan like like uh what was it uh aubrey said uh, what did aubrey say he said this was uh this was really good and this was part of his thing he says oh here it is he says i i'd feel like i was the ba a backup plan helping raise another man's kid no don't you're not the backup plan you are the plan you are part of the total of that plan and it's not like this fiendish, like, ha ha, we're going to get Aubrey and we're going to get him to pay for the kids. It's not that it's like, -uh -uh. it's not like this melodramatic thing. It's that that's what women are taught from the time they're five years old to the time they're, I don't know, 38 years old, however old they are with three kids, right? From four different fathers, I don't know how that happens. Three kids from two different fathers. Because they think that that's the way it should be. That's a female correct society. In a female correct society, a hero is the guy who steps up, is the guy who's here. You're not the, you're not a backup plan. You are the plan. You're the guy that she has to get with so that she can make up for the decisions that she made, the reproductive decisions that she made with the guy who was hot, who was fun, who she thought maybe at one time when in her youth that she could lock down and then turn into that guy. But no. Either he didn't have the options or she was better. Or she, he didn't want to, he's alpha, right? Women want that. Here's a, here's the, the, the plan, the overall thing. Like we've talked about, uh, people ask me about polyandry or poly, polyamory lately. Whenever I say, I don't think polyamory is a good idea. Guys will jump out of the woodwork and they go, man, it's a great idea, man. I've got four girls and they live together with me and it's awesome, man. It's just like a, you know, an orgy all the time, or it's like a porn movie or, or, um, or it's Abu American who has four wives. Now he's not nailing them all at the same time. They're not doing like orgies or anything. I mean, he's got, got options and permanent options because they're his wife. I think he has four wives. Forgive me if I have three, but you probably like to have four, <laughs> but, um, or maybe you wouldn't. Um, but there's, there's those options that are already there. That's what, whenever I mention polyamory guys go, why are you, why are you so down on poly, man? It's great for a guy, but that's not the reason why poly is popular, right? Poly popular. That's not why it's popular right now. It's not popular for guys. It's popular for women because we've reached a point socially, socio-sexually, let's just say, since the sexual revolution where we've empowered women to such an extent that they're going to be the women that are like, like the, the rise of the she economy, like our girl in today's thumbnail. She's going to be single. She's going to be childless. Um, that That's going to be the average woman in Western societies is single and childless. We're already seeing it in China. We're seeing it in Japan. We're seeing it in, in India. We're seeing it in other countries right now. The United States is yeah, well, maybe we're there. I think we're, we're already there, right? 42% of children born out of wedlock. That's men's fault. Well, it's also women's fault because we've we've established a social order, a female correct social order that incentivizes women to hypergamy. It incentivizes women to alpha fucks only because that's, that's the mating strategy because when beta bucks is already taken care of, or the promise of beta bucks is that when you, like Sheryl Sandberg says, when you get to be 30, don't worry. There'll be a guy there who's, who's going to make partner in the law team and he's going to be a winner and he's going to be the guy he's to ride in on his white horse and save you. And if he's not, he's going to be the guy, he's going to be the dad who stepped up. So go ahead and nail the guy in the hot, uh, in the foam cannon party, have his babies because don't worry, we're going to set things up so that when you get to be 29 to 31 years old, there'll be a guy, there'll be a beta in waiting going, ah, oh, my ship has finally come in. I finally hit pay dirt. That's why.
And we've done that for, well, really since the 70s. So at least four generations. If you count the boomers, we've done it for five generations. And now this is the result. Young lady, and that this is the result of all of that. That's the result right there. That's that. That's your victory. You've, congratulations, rejoice, women. Everything has been done for you. Everything is done. You don't have to worry about the dishes. You don't have to worry about. Uh, you, you just order it from Amazon. It shows up at your front door. Get a couple of cats. You'll be happy. Don't worry. Keep buying my, please, ladies, whatever you do, keep buying flavored vodka. Lots and lots of it. Preferably my brands. Keep doing it. My, my daughter's almost through college now. Keep going, please. Because people will make a lot of money off of that. Women are very, we, have, we always say, you know, like for men, like sex sells. Duh. Yeah, of course it does. We can sell like Sports Illustrated, oh, maybe not now, but we used to be able to sell Sports Illustrated uh, swimsuit editions because we had a hot piece of ass on there. It's easy to sell sex to guys. It's easy to sell, sell things through sex to guys. For women, eh, you got to be a little more careful. There's other ways to do it. You have to appeal to women's emotional side because women prioritize emotion above reason. Men tend to prioritize reason before emotion unless sex is involved. <laughs> and we're like, oh, throw reason right out the window. Um, who else do I got here? Sam. Sam Kotsky says, what's going on with women largely supporting Johnny Depp and booing uh, Amber Heard, uh, why isn't the sisterhood uniting behind her? Uh, well, the sisterhood is uh, is uniting behind her because the female judge who ruled against Johnny Depp, I would call that part of the sisterhood uniting behind her. That's why. Doesn't matter it, you, whether there's popular support or whatever. Like, I think Johnny Depp, his days are over. Amber Heard's days are over. This time next year, you won't even care about Amber. Maybe you'll still hear about John, unless Johnny like really pulls a rabbit out of his hat with a, with his career. I think both both of them are just going to sort of ride off into the sunset. And really, what does Johnny Depp have to do? So he's a multi gajillionaire. He's he's very beta, first of all, very beta guy. They go, well, you're talking about he's a he's a famous actor. Well, he's beta when it comes to women. Let's just let's just put it at that because he got wrapped up in a. Uh, a very damaged, very uh, psychologically, clinically damaged woman. So did Elon Musk, by the way, too. They both have the same taste. Hey, Donovan, what's up? Uh, $20. Thank you, my friend, very much for that. I uh, am the godfather, I guess, today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mark Daniels. Jeez, man. Thank you for the hundred bucks, my friend. Uh, I did what works with women when I was younger but I didn't understand why it worked so well until I read your book. Thank you. Uh, I'm passing that on to my five boys. Wow, cool. Uh, age 20 and under. Good. Uh, be careful. 15 to 20 is good. And only if they want to read. And uh, great knowledge and men. And thanks. Thank you for that, that 100 bucks. Let me give you, and because you were so generous, um, I give you a piece of advice when you're turning your sons onto the red pill. Um. It's better that you lead by example. I know that sounds really corny, but it's true. You, it's better to live it and then have them. And then when they ask questions, then you explain it to them. They have to be part. You can't just go, okay, Sonny, sit down and I'm going to tell you about, tell you about women's nature. There, they, can I get back to my Xbox? Right. You ha it has to be at a point where they're willing to listen to you and you have to have a relationship with them where you're doing something and you're imparting that kind of, it's, it's great to impart wisdom to your kid. I found this out. It's great to impart wisdom to your kids when it doesn't sound like you're imparting wisdom to your kids. <laughs> the the stuff that sticks is the stuff that you didn't realize was going to stick. And there's a ways to like, look, you know, kind of wait for your moment kind of thing. But I would suggest this is if you have sons between the ages of 15 and 20, go ahead, give them the book. But if you do and they read it, make sure it's a project. Like say, oh, did you read this, this part of the book today? Let's talk about the soulmate myth. Let's talk about iron rule of Tomasi number three. Let's talk about whatever it is. It's better if you have a discussion about that so that you are involved and you're going, Hey, I, I just picked this up, but let's read it together and see what, what it's all about and have that conversation. That's, that's gonna, it's going to sink in better. If it seems like something that's like genuine and mutual between the two of you, there's your thing. So let me, let me continue a little bit more here with the, the paternity thing, because I think this is important when, um, one of the things that all, practically all about, actually all of the women in criticizing Aubrey Huff in this thread uh, are, don't understand is that men have an innate revulsion response to guy or to women who have children already. 
you don't have to teach a God. I mean, you, well, you can teach him, but you don't have to um, convince a guy not to date a single mother. I know that sounds odd, right? Like people say, well, what are you talking about? They want they, these guys think it's a great thing. It's a great idea. Well, for the most part, guys don't want to get with a woman who has already been with another guy. That's uh, in fact, we, we, we consider that guy heroic and an outlier or out of the ordinary because he is repressing that revulsion response. And he's also going against his paternal instincts by doing so. Now I've seen, um, I think it was National Geographic or some, I've seen some animal shows where um, the alpha male silverback gorilla goes into the troop and it kills off the other alpha male. And then he kills off all the other, you know, like infanticide is like something that it's an uglier aspect of the animal kingdom and human beings would probably do the same. Actually, human beings have done the same thing uh, for a while. And now we're civilized and we don't do those things, but we manifest that in other ways. Um, like step parents or extended family, like mom's boyfriend is usually the one who like it's, he's eight times more likely to abuse a child or abuse the children, the biological children of the, the wife or whatever, than the actual biological father. We don't talk about those stats, but that's another stat that, that is really ugly side of extended blended, whatever you want to call it, you know, cutesy word, you come up with it to extend to, to step families, let's say. Are they all like that? No, of course not. But there are eight times. If there is abuse, eight time, eight more times than normal. Uh, it's usually the the boyfriend of the uh, of the of the wife or the ex wife, and and it's frustrating. It's probably frustrating for the biological fathers to actually have to deal with that because now they're not only dealing with the state, they're dealing with the fact that the decision that their ex wives made to get with that guy who is violent enough to do that, there's nothing you can really do. Authority again. You want to know why? Why is it that guys are the usually? Usually, it's the biological father who kidnap his own kids. It, the, statistically, it is going to be that. That's how it's going to happen, because mom nine times out of ten. Well, what is it? Eighty. Rich will tell me that the stats. Eighty some eighty six, eighty seven percent of the time, uh, the custody, a uh, sole custody goes to the woman, and. When you see a guy who's kidnapping his own kids and you get the Amber Alert or whatever, and they, they chase the guy down and everything, and they bring him to justice and frog march him into the, the jail, it's usually because the guy wants to get his kids. Uh, is it because, you know, there's a lot of things that go along, but let's just, let's look at the stats here. Is that eight times more likely for the stepfather or the boyfriend or whatever to be the one abusing? I would argue that a lot of times when a guy has takes desperate measures like that, he knows he's going to go to jail. He knows he's going there's something he's going to be a fugitive with his own kid. But why would he take that chance? Because he has parent he has a paternity a paternal instinct. Men have a paternal instinct. We want to provide for and we want to know that the kid is ours and we also want to provide for that kid and we want to keep that kid as ours. And we certainly want to defend that kid. That's that's written into our DNA. Protectorship sacrifice is written into men's DNA. So when, when we tell guys, it doesn't matter. We're telling them to repress that innate evolutionary instinct that's in them. Now that we're, we're telling them not to just repress the paternal instinct, the need to know that the child is theirs, but we're also telling them to repress that revulsion instinct. Because when you see a, a single mom, guys, guys have a, I don't say they have a revulsion, but they have a hesitancy. To get, I I can remember, gosh, what, being as young as my, as my 20s and finding out a girl had like a, a baby or had a had a kid. You know, what, what did Rich say? You know, it's fun to bang them, but don't marry them and don't get in a relationship with them. And that's a good policy. And if you can do that, but the problem is, is for most guys, for most beta male guys today, they see this as a mating strategy. Well, I can't get with women who are single because they're so far above me or so much more powerful than me or so much more attractive or I'm so low on the totem pole that. It seems like a good idea to, uh, the only way I'm going to solve my reproductive problem is to assume the responsibilities of parental investment responsibilities of another man's child. Because if that's the case and she falls in love with me, then she'll have my kids too. It's, it's sort of like you're, you win by default. <laughs> and for a lot of guys, that seems to, it it's, makes practical sense. Like why, why, why wouldn't you, right? Like just get with a, get with single mommy. And make and it and single mommies make it really enticing too, right? They they have an incentive to try harder because they need a guy who has benefits. 
they need a guy to be in there to help them watch the kids or to do whatever. Uh, why is it that women would, uh, why is it that our laws um, allow women to simply put whatever name on the, on the birth certificate and there's no question about that? Why is it on the laws that um, DNA testing, when a guy wants to get DNA, it's, it's, it's like pulling teeth for a guy to get a, D, a DNA test. Why is it on the laws that if it is discovered through 23andMe or genetic testing or whatever, that the child is not genetically the father's and the woman wants the, wants the doctor, the OBGYN or whatever, wants the doctor and the medical staff to keep quiet about it, that they are bound by law not to tell the father. That's because we live in a gynocentric social order. That is it. In any other era, if that were to happen, that guy would know immediately and she'd be out on the streets because why? Because you broke the contract. You broke the compromise. The compromise is this. I will give up my unlimited access to unlimited sexuality and invest everything I have in you. I will uh, till death do us part, uh, forsaking all others. Only thing I know is that all I have to know is that the kid is mine. Find out the kid's not yours. Guess what? I don't have to keep up my end of the bargain. In a female correct social order, no, you're on the hook. Even if you're not the father, you have to. You're still on the hook. And I can. I I should go dig. I should go dig this up for. You. I, I didn't want to make today about paternity, but it kind of dovetails into what we're into the modern woman thing today. So when, ever since the, the sexual revolution, when we have empowered women and we've make it, we've turned this Western culture into a gynocentric female, correct, uh, society, globalizing society, that's what we get. That's why we're confused. We're four, we're four generations, five generations in from changing that social convention about that compromise. So now a single mother is a superhero. It used to be there was a stigma, like the church would say, no, you're, that's, that's against God. Or if you had a baby out of wedlock prior to like 1960 like and 1965, then that brought shame on the family. You had to put her away. Maybe you gave the baby up for adoption. Maybe the baby was raised by grandparents, whatever. But the shame of having a child out of wedlock was a stigma that was, especially in white upper middle class um, you know, families and stuff, that was a big deal. Now- it is nothing but pride, man. It's a point of pride. Go look through all the the, the uh, people giving you their their experiences being raised by a stepfather. They're proud that mom was a single mother. They're proud of that. And this is only fifty years, maybe fifty years, that that stigma changed. Whereas prior to the sexual revolution, hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, of course you know, kings and, and nobles and stuff had mistresses and all that other good stuff. Sure. Sure. Exactly. And there's ch where children were bastard. We call them bastard children, right? They were illegitimate children. God forbid you call them illegitimate today. God forbid you say, well, you're a bastard child. You have no father. That was a calm. That wasn't a, that wasn't a bad word <laughs> back in like, you know, the Renaissance, you, you're a bastard. I mean, maybe it was, maybe it was an insult, but but it was a, it was a descriptive. It was an adjective rather than an invective, right? Because it was different. Things were things were changing. It only took fifty years to do that. And what to, what did it? Empowering women, making gynocentrism the the primary. So when I talk about like paternity as something that is like an evolutionary drive in men, that's one thing. Uh, revulsion is another. Um, we are, we tend to be, uh, revolted or we tend to like get away from things like, we, you know, avoid like dead bodies or feces or whatever, because, because it can carry disease or whatever. That's, that's easy for us. That's instinctual revulsion. Like ugh, somebody barfs and you barf too. That's instinctual revulsion. Uh, because, and I, I, I think I'm right about this. Somebody will, will probably correct me, but I think that, you know, when somebody barfs and you, you smell it and you, go, uh, and you can't help but like, like barf too. I think what the reason that that instinctual reflex is because if somebody is barfing, it used to be that they had to get expel the poison or whatever that was making them sick out of their bodies. And if you saw that and you smelled that and you saw that and you were, your gut like instinctive reaction is to barf too, it was probably because there was this, I don't know, evolutionary thing. I don't know what to call it, but like dynamic, I guess that if that happened, you saw somebody do that, you would barf too, because that would ensure that whatever you guys, maybe you were eating the same thing, you had the same berries and he's sick and he's barfing and you're like, oh, and you start barfing too. 
like maybe that is sort of like a mutual like survival adaptation. I don't know if it's a behavioral adaptation or an instinct or something, but it seems like that would make sense. I don't know. I, I'm again, spitballing. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that that seems like that would be a connection there. Anyways, you guys don't want to hear about that. Uh, what did you say? Uh, poor Johnny Jeb. How do you avoid cycle girls? Oh, what are the telltale signs? Well, here's one right here. Here's a telltale sign right for you right there. That's a telltale sign. What is her, what is her, what does her flat look like? What does her apartment look like? How many cats does she have? How do I get away from that Rolo? You, you, you know what you do? You listen to your gut. <laughs> How do I know she's psycho? Mm. The medium is the message, my friend. The medium is the message. Um, that was Sam. This is mask. Mask says, Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. It only now just occurred to me that women are paying for your livelihood. I need to get stocks and share. Off you. Oh, you mean like my liquor? Yeah, well, okay. But in my defense, I also own a well, I have ownership stake in a couple of um, whiskey brands, a Canadian actually whiskey brands as well. So it's not just women. Well, maybe the women, female whiskey drinkers too. Whiskey as in W-H-I-S-K-Y, not E-Y. There's a difference. You know what the difference is? One's Canadian, one's one's American or English. <laughs> Whiskey in Canada has no E. There's your, there's your trivia. There's your liquor trivia for the day. Um, so why are women obsessed with cats? I can tell you why they're obsessed with cats because it, and I can also tell you why um, they're obsessed with little dogs and stuff too, is because it allows women to sort of put an emotional investment into something that is unconditional. There's no, there's nothing they have to do to get that love back, right? Oh, my dog will always love me. I, I love my dogs too. You know, I, I, human beings have lived with dogs for a long time and cats, I guess, too. Um, I think that if women are obsessed with little dogs or little animals, it's usually because on some psychological level, they want to know that they are lovable, that they as human beings are lovable. And that they can say, well, see, I can love. I have the capacity to love. Even though there's nobody in this house, I've never had any kids. I'm a psychological wreck. Um, I am on, I'm most likely on antidepressants, but I, I've always got Pookie here so I can just snuggle up with him because he'll love me. See, I am lovable. When you talk about like an, a relationship or a connection with like love, you, you're connecting with somebody who has faults and has advantages, who loves you and may, might even hate your guts at some time. And if you can't handle that, where do, where do you go, ladies? I'm going to marry a chandelier. I'm going to marry a bridge. I'm going to marry Pookie. I'm going to marry myself because I'm lovable. Yeah. Is it crazy? Yes, it's definitely crazy. So is single, never married, childless, is that a victory? Is that where you wanted to be, ladies? Is that where you want to go in the next 10 years? Because that, according to Forbes and according to Morgan Stanley, that's where you're going to end up. You're going to end up like a girl in the, in the illustration here. Um, so let me, I, I think I've covered a lot of this stuff already. Let me see social construction. Um, let's see, old order thinking versus, okay, so when we um, i guess i can segue into that the the idea of paternity in guys is an innate response it's something we want to know and we are revolted by women who are uh, you, you don't want to know why like women like try to tell you that a, uh, a another girl is a slut or something like that it's because it's intrasexual combat and why is it that women you, know, you want to talk about slut shaming women slut shame women more than men have ever slut shamed women. In fact, men today wouldn't dare slut shame women because if they did, or even it was implied that they did, they would lose their jobs, they'd lose their families, they'd get a raise, they'd get canceled. Today, it's even more dangerous. So when you talk about slut shaming, it's usually women going, oh, God, I slut shame. That's, the, that's intrasexual combat. And the reason why slut shaming is effective for women or they think it's effective is because it plays into men's innate revulsion of women who are bad reproductive choices for them. Well, she's a slut, so that means you'll probably get cuckolded. That's the underlying message. That's the medium, right? That's the, that's the message in the medium. She's such a slut. Look, only a slut would wear hoop earrings. Only a slut would wear that dress. Only a slut would, like, they would, that's, and you're like, really? I would never do that for you. I would never do that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good girl. <laughs> Remember the good girls? Um, what, what are you guys telling me now? 
Sorry, I'm catching up. And I got something inbound from... Also, who else is hitting me up here today? Oh, 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 okay. Okay, that's it. Donovan, don't bug me. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, I wanted to I wanted to talk about that today. I also wanted to dig in a little bit into um are we our sisters keepers? Because what's gonna happen right now is the first response, and I, I want to read actually, I think I'll just read this for you. I have a um I have a post called Our Sisters Keepers. And this is not something new. Um You'll see, and in Aubrey Huff, I, the reason I brought this up is because in Aubrey Huff's um, thread uh, about uh, single mothers and everything, um, the first thing out of anyone's mouth, uh, male, female, ally, whatever, is that it's men's fault, or it takes two to tango, right? Or we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't abort our children if you guys could just keep it in your pants. Well, that might have flown in an era when we weren't in a gynocentric social order. In an era where women have 100% control over reproduction, when in an era when the, once the sperm leaves your body, you're powerless over it. In that era, sorry, ladies, all bets are off. You know, it's like you are you are in control of the pregnancy after that. It's your uterus, and I don't have a say in it, right? Remember that. Well, guess what? Now it's on you. But I I wrote this in um gosh when was this 2015 because the most common response was well if men would be better then women would be better too if uh and and you'll get this from trad cons will say well rollo you tell guys to go and spin plates and not to you know to stick with one woman well i don't need to because first off the guys who are out there spinning plates are few and far between so don't worry about me turning a generation of guys into like incorrigible libertine assholes they're not there. They're, we are definitely not there yet. I don't have an, there's no Rolo's army. Okay. <laughs> there's no cult of Rolo. Sorry. As much as people want to say that I, I'm a cult leader. There's no cult of Rolo right now, but I wrote this and this was part, for, this was our part of a, uh, it's in the description, by the way, the, uh, it's called our sister's keeper. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to sort of pick this off of here really quickly. I, I put this, this in, I said, the feminine imperative relies on memes and social conventions, which shift the ownership of women's personal liabilities for their sexual strategy onto men. This is something that I think that we still have to sort of parse today, certainly in Aubrey Huff's thread. But whenever we talk about abortion, whenever we talk about um, consequences that affect women's lives, like when we talk about, um, well, or if we, if we talk about like how the women on OnlyFans are all skanks, right? They're all sluts. They're making so much money. They're no, they're no longer prostitutes. They're now sex workers. Well, why, how do we get there? Why, did, why is that? If men would have been better, like we, m women can only get away with what men will let them get away with. Horseshit. Not now. That might have been true earlier. That might have been true in the 70s or the 80s, even maybe even into the early 90s, but not now. Not for the last 20 years. Because just to suggest that a man should have authority over a woman is is misogyny, and you'll get erased. Look at look at Aubrey. Aubrey didn't even like Aubrey is he his his uh you know his his persona, for certainly his online persona, it's just his personality in general. You know, he he puts himself out there sort of this classically conventionally masculine guy. So when he says, "Hey, I don't, uh, I never understood as a man why you would date or marry a single mother if you're single with no kids on your own," right? That's what he said. It's not like he said. You women who are having babies out of wedlock. It's not like he's getting on the pulpit and going, the Lord said no babies for you. The Lord said you're going to hell because you're a single mama. That That's not what he's saying. He's just saying, I'm asking a question here. And women lose it. They lose their minds because we're looking at a two, at least the last two generations of women who are like, how, how dare you? How dare you? How dare you talk about that? Because it gives up the game. It gives up that mating strategy. You know why women hate gold diggers? Because it gives up the game, right? It gives up the transactional nature of sex anyways. Like, oh, all women are gold diggers. They're prostitutes, basically. They're just selling out sex. Like you look at sugar daddies. We don't want to call that. We don't want to call that prostitution. We don't want to call OnlyFans prostitution. We don't want to call, you know, flirting and showing off your, your ass on Instagram. We don't call that like soft porn. We don't want to call that what it is. In any other era, we would, but we don't want to call it that because it gives away the game. 
when uh when i did that episode with rich cooper and we were talking about instagram boyfriends and how guys were like being like corralled by their you know their beta chump boyfriends were were, were corralled by their girlfriends you know in aruba or cancun or wherever the hell they were you know, on vacation and they were on the beach and oh no take a picture of me take give me a good one here you know lean over the side of the boat so you can take a picture of me and my girlfriends hey you know look we're living it up they're like the girl that's in the illustration you know hey we got a martini um so that they can put it on instagram because that is sexual advertisement let's be honest oh we want to look cute we just want no that is advertisement that is advertisement of your brand of me whether you're doing whether you're consciously aware of the fact that you're doing it that way is is different like when i see when i see a girl who i know who is in a relationship or she's married and you look at her instagram and there's no pictures of the dude and there's lots of pictures of her probably shot by the guy uh, in a swimsuit or running around with her girlfriends or living it up here or whatever and the guy's featured maybe he's in one or two but he's not very heavily featured she's advertising that's part of the plan when i talk about it i give away the i give away the game when i talk about the innate underlying principles of men's paternity interests and their natural revulsion to single mothers i'm giving up the game when aubrey asks a simple question like i don't understand why why would any guy want to be a, a plan b they have to violently smash he's, he's trending on twitter for christ's sake you know they have to make it viral and smash him in the face as much as they can First of all, because it goes against their ideological, you know, their their ego investments in their ideology in, in female correct gynocentric ideology. So they have to smash it down that way. But they smash them down because it gives up the game. It gives up the strategy. Well, we can't have guy. We can't have he's got quite the reach, and we can't have the guys that we need to be betas and waiting when we're 31 years old to not be waiting for us because Aubrey Huff said guys don't date single mothers that puts a lot of that that gives up the game man it gives up the mating strategy it makes those women like instead of the woman who has her cake and eats it too the girl who mates with the guy in the hot can or hot hot can and in the hot foam can and the hot guy in the foam cannon party and she has breeds with him and has babies and now now we need this guy now we need man with benefits we need the beta in waiting and he's not there because aubrey huff asked one question to 10,000, 20,000, I don't know how many thousand, 100,000 people. How many of those guys go, yeah, he's right. I never thought of it that way. I, I've had a half a dozen guys in my own feed right now just say, hey, man, I, you know, I always knew this stuff, but I couldn't put, any, put it to words. Well, Rolo does, and now you're a cult leader. Now you're the, you're the devil, and you ain't no folk devil. You're the real devil because you gave up the game. I talk about hypergamy. Yeah, you're an incel. Uh, don't listen to what he has to say. Disqualify, disqualify, disqualify. You can make me an asshole, but you can't make the data an asshole <laughs> because the data makes you an asshole. <laughs> what did you say? Exactly where is the line between being good, a good dominant alpha, and being me too out of existence? Well, you know where that line is it's remains it's you remaining in your own identity like how important is your own identity to you guys ask me this they'll say well you know you can't elf alpha the state rollo so why even bother why just just you know what just give up and you know you, what is it i i, I don't want to get me too out of existence you're not going to be me too out of existence the fact that you're even saying that just tells me that there's something else going on right there i'm going to give you an example here and I'm probably going to piss off all the people who go, I hate it when he goes off on these side tangents. So if that's you, just turn out right now because I'm going to give you a side tangent here really quickly. Have you guys ever played Monopoly? Of course you have. Everybody's played Monopoly, right? If you live in the United States, you probably have. What's Monopoly about? Monopoly is about monopolizing the board, right? It's Monopoly. I mean, that it's was it, wasn't it like created in the 1920s or something like that, in the Roaring Twenties? And it was like, okay, if you not, Monopoly has a has a strategy to it. And I have a point. Like, track with me here because this it's, it's going to be funny when we get to the punchline here. But when Monopoly, like, have you ever won a game of Monopoly? No, you probably didn't. When you're a kid, you ask God. <laughs> you throw it. You play to the point where somebody has all the all the money and all the houses. You can't win and you go to jail because you can't, you got to go to jail because you can't pay your rent. 
And so, and there's tactics to it too. So like in the early stages of monopoly, what do you do? You got this, you got this amount of money. Do I buy up the cheap properties and sit on those and develop those? Or do I wait it out until I can get to park place in the boardwalk? Because once I get there, then I can really make some money, right? Is that, so what's the strategy are you using? And then there's the middle properties in the board. But for the most part, monopoly is a, an effort and how many people play Monopoly? How many people play Monopoly like with one on one? <laughs> that would be tough. Like I think Monopoly is probably more enjoyable when you have like six people, six kids playing it, until one kid really dominates and wins the game, right? Because he's monopolizing everything. And so, what do the people do? What do you do? You go, ah, screw it, fuck you, yo, yo. You really throw up the board, right? That's what guys are doing right now. They're throwing up the board with respect to the gynocentric social order. They can't win, so they don't play. And I hear this all the time, guys crying from inside their cars with their big freaking ZZ top beards, with their duck dynasty out <clears throat> accents, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Those guys are throwing the board up and maybe rightly so, right? Because they're, they lose, you lose. And by throwing up the board or you're the pigeon that shits all over the, uh, the chess board or whatever, because you lost the game. Um, that to me seems more like losing the game than it is about the game itself but you know well, that's the option right well i know i'm just not going to play and then i win because i don't play well you're not out of the game and you still got to keep playing the game but i will agree with you on this it is monopoly <laughs> it is monopoly and the monopoly and at this at this point right now just by default women have park place <laughs> and 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 boardwalk and i don't even know virginia street i don't know what the hell the other ones are all i, all I know is boardwalk and park place but so you can throw the game up and discuss and be done with it or you can try to outplay them or you can try to like i think what what gets me is that when it comes to when it comes to the dating when it comes to the sexual marketplace like at 22 23 women might have park place and boardwalk but when they get to you know 31 year well 30 about well, 29 30 31 years in the epiphany phase they don't own boardwalk anymore they might own some other properties that you might be able to afford that you might be able to even buy out you might be able to outplay them hell you might end up on boardwalk later on and therefore th the dynamic changes but you're not going to know that unless you're still playing monopoly so what are you going to do what's it worth to you and i wanted to make sure that i got this in here i'm going to i'll take some questions here in just a second but i wanted to make sure that I, I i threw this in here today because when i see when i see guys sort of giving up on the game i i, I know we i got criticized for for even talking to myron myron gains on our on our friday show right well they're telling guys to stay in the game because they're going to get fleeced they're going to get marched to the slaughterhouse. Well, no. Why is it why is it shameful to want to learn how to be better with women? Why is it shameful? Why is it a bad idea to want to learn how to be with women? Why is it a, a bad idea to want to uh, learn social skills that are not being taught, that maybe you didn't pick up on? I think one of the reasons it's shameful, is, or it seems like it's shameful, is because it's something you're supposed to already know. And for a lot of guys, they go, well, I already know this stuff. Forget it. I'm too cool. <laughs> I'm too cool for this stuff. I'm too cool for the red pill. But yet I'm going to, you know, comment and shit up my, this guy's comments or chat or whatever. Why? Well, because you're supposed to know this. It's something that's supposed to be intrinsic because a guy who is alpha, a guy who gets it, doesn't have to be taught. He should already have it. At least that's the impression. Anyways, guys, that's not the process, of course. You, know, you have to learn you, uh, through acculturation, socialization. You learn those things, or you should be learning those things, but they're not being taught right now. But you're supposed to get those. You're, you have a response. Part of your burden of performance as a guy is you have a responsibility, at least to yourself anyways, to be able to carry on a conversation and to be able to be charming, to, to you know charm the pants off a woman. You're supposed to be able to do that. Today, we don't, we don't know how to. Like I, I, when, I was in, when I was younger, I had to learn that on the fly. I'm not going to regale you with any stories of old, but I'm just saying I had to learn that by trial and error live in real time. We don't do that right now. It's much easier to sit like this woman in the illustration behind our screen and be comfortable and be comfy. My fat pants. Thanksgiving is time for your fat pants. <laughs> Let 
but it's shameful because we have this preconception that we should already know this stuff. Um, when Aubrey Huff is talking about, I don't understand why, why guys want to get into this. Why would, why instinctually, why it doesn't make sense for a guy to be invested in another man's genetic legacy. Well, we have to condition, 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 and we can't give up the game because they should already know this. Guys shouldn't even ask those questions. According to the people who are criticizing, even Dana Lash, should you should, this is a shit take, man. This is a bad take, brother. I agree with you on everything else, except for when you uh, make an unflattering observation of female nature. <laughs> okay, well, Sister Hoodoo Boralis aside, the, the inference is you should already know this. Don't ask, the, don't ask questions you don't want answers to. But I do, I'm just, I'm connecting dots that you don't seem to be comfortable connecting. And I think it's interesting why you're not, why you don't do that. Um, what did you say? Zomboy says, is it still worth it to read mystery method or is there a better, more updated book on game out there? Why does everybody ask me that? I need to write a book on game. Want me to write a book on game next? Now that religion is done. I should, I should write a game on techniques, but the problem is, is if I did something like that, people will go, all right. Here's what Rollo says. He's telling guys to go out there and march to the slaughterhouse. I could do that. You want me to give you game techniques? I can give you, I can tell you why they work. I can tell you why amuse mastery and cocky, funny and neg hits. And I can tell you all the emotional triggers in that. I can tell you why uh, evolutionarily speaking, why chick crack is a thing. I can, we can go through all that. Yeah. I think mystery method is definitely still worth a read. Uh, a, a lot of it is contextually out of date, but I think that more of it is sort of like uh, comprehensively still in, like as far as the, the actual principles in it still, still work, how you apply them have changed quite a bit. But uh, the, the, the mechanics, the human machine hasn't changed. The firmware hasn't changed. Just how that firmware is being applied has changed. Like, uh, and I get into it. Like if you watch Friday show, it's like, you know, uh, Instagram is the number one dating app on planet earth. It's not even Tinder. It's Instagram. Are you cool enough to hang out with? Well, why, why do we make those choices? Well, why do we think about that? Well, because you know, we make, we are aroused by things that are instinctual, that are evolutionary. Um, why do women go with the guys? Why do the, why do women go with violent men? Why do women get hybristophilia? Oh, did somebody give me that? Oh. Because they're in our evolutionary past, in our ancestral past, that's what made sense. That's what led to the three Ps back then. Now it doesn't. See, women ha don't have to worry so much about the three Ps. They don't have to worry about beta bucks anymore. And and even if they do, because women will say, sure we do. We still have to worry about where our next meal is coming from and we're destitute and poor and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, fine. But there is the perception that that side of hypergamy is or should be something that women are entitled to, to have satisfied. And that if that's the case, then they should be focusing on alpha fucks more than anything else. And if you don't believe, I, I, should, I should put a caveat in here because if you look at women in their party years from like 18 till about 28 years old, they tend to prioritize uh, hot guys. They tend to prioritize, uh, actually I'll put, the, I'll put the thing up here. If you look at this, if you look at women in the, uh, the demographic, I, I guess I pegged it at, at 20. So you look at 20 to about 27, 28, maybe a little past that 26, 27. Yeah. Somewhere in the epiphany phase right there. I, I kind of pegged the epiphany phase a little early in this one. Remember I wrote this back in 2015, but the, uh, the 20 through let's say 28 range right there is what I call the party years. Women are not looking for long-term in those years, unless they have some sort of like extenuating circumstances, like their religious convictions, the cultural, you know, buffers, cultural decisions, but for the, for the most part in a globalizing, westernizing, uh, gynocentric culture, this is where women come into their own, right? They're, that's, as you can see there, I put it at the bottom, it says peak, peak SMV for women is 23. The woman that's in this illustration right here, does she look like she's 23? About how old would we say that this, uh, this average, this, uh, demog what, what demographic is this young black female with the hoop earrings in what, what would she be in? Is she 30 epiphany phase? Maybe is that where you get when like, that's, the, that's the, that's the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, right here. <laughs> 
that's that's what you have to work for like that's that's you have behold ladies you have everything is done for you right rejoice because you have nothing but choice we've we've taken care of everything and that's where you end up well during the 20 to 28 party years period as you can see in the timeline here this oh by the way this is for my second book which is called preventive medicine uh in that book i outline um what you can expect as you can see here what you can expect from women at different phases of their maturity so from 15 all the way up to 50. and why did i start at 15 because there are guys that follow me who are in high school who are 15 16 17 years old and they're dealing with girls in their high school or teenage girls and they want to know what's going on if you read the book i will tell you but from 15 all the way up to 50, um, through the break phase, a party years, epiphany phase, there's a transition phase right there because that transition phase is when women like think that they're turning over a new leaf. That's when, uh, and I'm not saying thing, I should say they do. They, they honestly like believe that they are turning over, they're, they're changing something about their lives for the better. And that's usually the, uh, the transition phase right there. Then you've got the security, uh, security anxiety and I, I put that, so if you look at the security phase and then on top of that, I put the security anxiety thing right there. That's if women do not consolidate on long-term security by that point. And remember this, a lot of people will think that when I talk about long-term security, that I mean, oh, they need a guy with lots and lots of money. No, not necessarily. I mean, that's certainly part of it. But security implies a lot of different things to women. And emotional security is definitely one of those. Because I think on some level of, 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 of consciousness, right around the security phase right there, like 30, the transition to the security phase, I think that's when women really, that's when women hit the wall. And I mean hit the wall mentally, I don't want to say physically, but that's when they realize that they are a depreciating asset. And they have been, their, their sexual market value has been on the descent. It's a perishable asset. It's been on the descent since 23. That. Again, I'm, I'm just telling you the realities. I'm not saying, ha ha, yay, we win. Because guys will say, well, women can get laid at any age they want to. All they got to do is go to the club and spread their legs. Well, yeah, but does that mean that they have, are they getting security from the guys that they're spreading their legs for? You know, there's still so much that goes along into, there's so many variables that go into that. But, but uh, by and large right around 30, 31, 32 years old, that transition phase, uh, the last half of the epiphany phase, there's a need or, the, or there's a prioritization of a need for security. And that's when you get cats. Uh, you guys asked me about, what, what about cats and dogs? That's when women get their cats. That's when women turn into spinsters. That's when, uh, what was it? Um, if you ever watch, you'll watch it now because it's, it's a, uh, it's December, right? It's a Christmas classic. Go watch It's a Wonderful Life and listen to when Mary, when Mary says, um, I don't want to be an old maid. In fact, in the, in the last sequence where like everything goes to hell and it's like as if George Bailey was never born, um, she turns into an old maid. That's the worst thing that could happen to a woman in like the 1920s up to like the 1940s or something like that. I turned into one. She's an old maid. She never had any kids. She's a spinster. She's a librarian. She's the librarian. <laughs> that was like the ultimate at that point. So during that point though, like right around the security phase, that's because people were asking about that. I thought I'd throw that out there today. Um, right around the security phase, that is when women start to think about like, okay, I am not as com sexually competitive as I can possibly be. And this phase, by the way, all of this stuff that I just showed you on that, that timeline, that is contextual for this era. Guys will say, well, you know, back in the Renaissance period, a girl was, she was at her prime when she was 15. Uh, yeah, back then, not now. So what did you say? Uh, consider my pre-order of the rational book for five per game. You know, I might do that. I don't know if I'll think I should make it part of the series. I don't know. All right. We're at the two hour mark. So I will take questions for a little while here because I'm trying to cut down on the three hour episodes here. I'm going to try to get uh, rich and uh, Aubrey Huff on tomorrow. Even if it's just for like an hour, or hour 20, we'll, we'll want to talk about this, this tweet because it's, I think it's, pertinent it'd be great to get i hope if you came in off of that tweet welcome <laughs> i was hoping to have aubrey but uh, it didn't work out because he's not on his computer he's on his phone uh, lucas lucas bly what do you have to say should i just do q a for the rest of the show 
think I will. Oh, so so Andy, um, yeah, okay, okay. Um, I don't know. Should I make it part of the Rational Mail series, or should I make it like a standalone thing? I actually was considering doing a standalone thing after. Uh, on, give me some time off, please, first, because I've been busting my ass on this this book. But I think when I, I don't know, I'm I, I'm I'm eager to get back to my blog. If you're one of my blog readers right now, just know that I'm really I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Uh, I wish I could have been more active, but this book has taken so much out of me creatively, uh, like dynamically. I don't know what, what else to call it. It's, it's taken so much out of me, like energy wise, like mentally. Um, yes, I've been doing a lot of these shows. Yes, I've, I've been trying to keep up with with doing these things. Uh, I probably bit off more than I could chew with a lot of the stuff that I, I decided to do this year, but then COVID hit it and then I'm dealing with a lot of other crap right now too. But uh, I, I'm so looking forward to getting back to the blog and just doing weekly blogs again because yeah, I, I need to write, but all of my I need to write energy has gone into the book. And that's why I've been kind of like, I do one post a month right now, if that, and I didn't do anything for, for November because I've been so like, like tunnel vision on this book, but it's going to be good, man. I, I'll, 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 you know, here we're at the end of the show. I'll, I'll tell you right now, this is probably next to the first book. This is probably my, my, I'm proudest of this book more than, and I, I love all my books, right? They're like children, right? They you send them out in the world and hope they do good. But I think this one is is something special because it is. Um, I don't say it's all original, but it's so because I, I did use some. I, I remodify. Well, I haven't used actual direct posts, but I pulled material from other posts to, to put into chapters because it was relevant. But other than that, I would say it's like eighty five percent all original material, and. It's one thing if you, I've, I've discovered this is it's one thing if you're like a creative writer and you're writing a story, you're trying to make things like, you know, cohesive and you're doing character development and plot development and that kind of stuff. And it's sort of like, you can just sort of go and do it. And you're, you're kind of ambling along and, and just trying to figure out like where you want to go with this. And then there's writing like technically, like I have done for the last four, well, now four books. And you have to be, you have to always have, I, you guys know this, I struggle with two things being concise <laughs> and being comprehensive and finding a balance between those two. So, and, and particularly in red pill topics, that's really difficult to do. Anyways, a few months in my ex 27 agreed to tattoo my name on her body. Is your, Lucas Blair. I want it right on my ass on her body. But after two months, she changed her mind after my ultimatum still did it though. Thoughts. <laughs> Did you tell her to do it or did she like want to do it? Like, I'm, I don't know. See, I'm not into ultimatums and not because you shouldn't be dominant and like, God shouldn't you know, like, you know, like I, but whenever I talk, I think I've talked about boundaries before. Whenever we talk about boundaries, boundaries have to be enforced, not talked about. The only way a woman or a dog or a child understands boundaries is if there's a consequence to it. Now you can say, don't, go out and don't run out in the street, Johnny, you'll get hit by a car. So you, you know, can spell it out for him and explain it to him so that they get an idea of what would happen. But it's another thing when Johnny runs out and he gets hit by a car and he almost dies and he goes, I ain't doing that again. Explicate is not a good thing. Demonstrate, do not explicate. And so when you say, well, I gave her an ultimatum. I told her, I want my name tattooed on your boob. Well, that's nice. It's a nice sentiment. It's certainly, uh, it's certainly if she did it on her own, she said, Hey, Lucas, look, I got it right here. It says Lucas. That means more that should, that should, that should mean more to you than if you go, bitch, I want you to get that on your, get that on your boob. I want to see my name, Lucian, Kentucky master blaster or whatever. And uh, whatever it is like that, that is meaningless. Because you, it's an obligation rather than genuine desire. So she changed her mind. Did she do it? I don't know. Did you say she did it? Uh, agreed to do it. And she changed her mind. After my ultimate, she did it though. Mm, I don't know. I, that seems like I would rather, it's better to have her want to do it. Like, like she's like, oh, I can't wait to get my name tattooed. That's the, that's the, the hell yes girl. You'd rather have the hell yes girl than the you better do it girl. 
Mm-mm-mm-mm. Oh, there it is. Oh, that was Lucas. This is Dragon. Says, are there any female authors you would recommend for dealing with this issue in raising daughters? No. <laughs> as simple as I can put it, no. Most, um, I don't are there, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I can't speak knowledgeably to this, but from my experience, from what I've read, most of the time when I've, and maybe this is just because I've been writing this book, but most of the time when I see messages from my mother to my daughter or uh, wisdom from grandma to the daughters of today, it's usually in women's ministry. It's usually a religious thing. It's usually the, the woman who is, or, um, and that's that's one aspect of it, or it's indirect, like uh, Sheryl Sandberg. Sheryl Sandberg writes "Lean In," and it's supposed to be this this you know uh, treatise uh, treatise on um, you know how to be a dominant alpha female in society and lean in, girl, and you can go and do it. And then she gives advice to women in their dating, like young women. And she says, you know, date all of the guys, the bad boys, the bad for you guys, the jerks, the uh, commitment phobic boys, basically that's what she's saying is bang all the hot guys, have sex with as many alphas as you can, but don't marry them because the things that make them sexy don't make them good husbands. But when you get to, I mean, literally explaining this in no, in no uncertain terms, this is hypergamy. Then when you get to be 28, 29 and you're ready to settle down, Funny how women are ready to settle down right at the time where it's they're they're aging out of the sexual marketplace or they are less competitive in the sexual marketplace. What a coincidence that is. Hmm. Uh, or their biological clock is ticking at 30. No, your biological clock was ticking at 23 because that's when you could carry a baby to term the, the easiest and you're at your hottest and you should be having hot monkey sex that results in reproductive sex, but we don't do that. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just, that's what the choices that women make, but we don't do that. Women hold out until they're 30, 31, God forbid you freeze your eggs and have them at 40, right? No, no. But the idea is that you have an, uh, your, your sexual market value is not perishable. And that's what she teaches. She teaches the idea that, oh, don't worry about it, you know, bang Chad and bang hot guy in the foam cannon party when you're 23 until you're 29. And then look for the guy with benefits, the guy who's, who wants to, oh, the guy who wants to be an equal partner. That's what she said. The guy who wants an opinionated woman is not afraid to do his own, to do the duties around the house, like wash the dishes and do the, do the laundry and take care of the kids of a powerful woman like you. You're, you're destined to become. <laughs> and, uh, and no, those guys aren't there. And they're not there for two reasons. They're not there because the red pill exists and the manosphere has been talking about this and it's sort of seeped into mainstream society, I think, over the last 10 years. That's one reason, but that's a very minor reason. The other reason is guys just see it happening. It just happens. They just, they, they, they go, this is a raw deal and they don't need me or anyone else to tell them that it's a raw deal. They just see that it's going on and because women have gone so over the top, that's unignorable for guys now. So, but that's what we teach. That's what we teach our girls. I don't teach my girls that I don't teach my, my girl that I told, I told my daughter, like <laughs> when she was 18, I said, when you get, to, but I was 22, I told her, I'd still tell her this. I said, you know, your best year is coming up. You better make the most of it. You better do what you, the best you can with it. And I'm not saying that there aren't other things that are important for you to do, but let's be honest. The, sh the store is called tw Forever 21, not Forever 41, because you're always going to want to look back on this time, maximize your potential. I would say the same thing to a guy who's 35 or 36 years old. Don't get married. Don't, you, you know, you're hitting your stride. You'll be in a better position. Like don't, what is it? Uh, don't consider monogamy until you're 30 years old. And even then don't consider anything that is like a legal binding, legally binding, you know, commitment. Certainly not until you have experienced women firsthand enough of them and enough times. And you are red pill aware, of course, to know that when you're 35, 36 years old, that you will be at the prime of your life when it comes to sexual selection. Because at that point, if you have maximized your potential, you'll have more of what makes a man attractive than at any other time in your life. 
Now guys will say, well, I'm 45 and I'm hitting my, stroke. well, me, yeah, because it laughs for a minute, it peaks and then it goes and slowly drops off. According to Huffington Post, I'm, I'm the hottest guy alive, man. It's like 50 is when guys like, that's what they said. 50 when you're 50, I'm like, I don't, I don't believe this, but, but that's what Huffington Post said. They said, I'm the shit. <laughs> I don't think I am, but that's, but. You know, so by by whatever your opinion is, well, however you estimate that, my estimate is this: is that by 36 years old, you're still in good enough shape that you, or if you have maintained your shape and you are in in good, you know, peak physical performance, and you know enough about nutrition and lifting and all that other good stuff, and you may partner in the law team or you have your own business or whatever, you're more mature, you can make better judgments, and you know women's nature at that point, you can know what you want to get involved in, and you know what you don't want to get involved in. There you have it. I think that uh, there aren't, so as far as books, I don't know any. If somebody wants to tell me what they think is a good one, I'd be happy to read it and see what I think. I've given, you know what the best book for uh, for raising daughters is? It's my third one, Positive Masculinity, because there's a whole section in there that's dedicated to raising daughters. I know, I raised one to 22 years old. Who runs Barter Town? What? Water town. <laughs> um, let me see. What was this? That was that. Am I done? I think I'm done. I think I caught up. Oh, wait. No, I didn't. Uh, Dragoon said this. He says, you mentioned talking to boys about your book. What if you have daughters? Are there any female authors? Okay, that's that was you. And then, okay, so I got to you. So I did get to you. Sorry, you gave me two. Sorry, I didn't see the second one, Dragoon. My bad. Uh, so th the best, the best thing you can do is get my third book. Um, Griff, Griff, Griff. You know, Hotep Jesus talked about that on, on Tim's devil cult. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to put that one right up on there. <laughs> I can't wait. I cannot wait until I get my, uh, my devil mountain coffee. It's uh, I'm going to, so I can finally put their logo on the stream. <laughs> Uh, I don't, by the way, I'm not getting any kickbacks from them. I'm just, they're going to give me free coffee and like maybe a mug and I'm good. So that's fine. But, and by the way, if you want to in any way endorse this show, uh, hit me up, let me know. I have so many people, or I just say so many people. I have so many people. I have so many uh, offers to like do like 30 second plugs or to endorse this show from like lots. Of, I, got, I got lots and lots of them, but I just like, that's not my wheelhouse, man. I mean, I drink coffee. Okay. So, so that's good. I can, I can do that. Um, I don't know. I might throw some cards or something. Oh, you know, the little cards that come where they write right about there, you know, on the, I might do something like that at some point as a, as an ad or something. I usually, I think people need to remember that when I, when I insert ads, I do, I manually insert the ads in all of my streams. And I do this uh, strategically, by the way. Um, but the average watch time of this show, uh, particularly when it's like long, <laughs> uh, is uh, about 30 to 35 minutes. So I, I usually put at least two ads between like the 15 minute mark and maybe the 25 to 30 minute mark. Because I, I want to put, you know, I want advertisers to be able to get like in that that part right there, and then I really kind of space them out. So, so that's my thinking in 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 putting ads into this. I mean, I got to do something. They're going to put ads in it anyway, so I might as well like t you know strategically do it. But it's like, okay, thank you by the way for the super chats today. My God, I got a hundred dollars, got fifty dollars. What else did I get here? This is awesome. Thank you guys. What's a douchey beard? This is a douchey beard. What's this is not a douchey beard. This is not even a beard, dude. This? this is a chin strap. I've been doing this chin strap for forever. You know, when I started doing this, it was when I lived in um, when I lived in Orlando, because all the Puerto Ricans who used to do my my hair and shave, they're like, "You should do a chin strap." So I'm like, "All right, let's try it." So I did it then, and I just kind of stuck, and I liked it well enough. Should I just shave it all out? I, you know, that would be yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you for that idea. I should do, uh, should I do some sort of affiliate thing with uh, Body Barber? That's a, that's where I, or, or um, I've been trying to learn <laughs> how to shave with a straight razor. And that is a 
that is a man's task. Let me tell you, because you have to have nerves of steel. <laughs> don't drink coffee. Don't drink, don't drink coffee and try to learn how to shave with a straight razor. <laughs> Um, I like it. The only, I think one of the reasons I like it is because the, the actual razor, I, I bought it from this guy off of Etsy who's like a, follows me on Twitter. It's beautiful. Like some of the stuff he does is fantastic. I guess there's like a, I don't know if it's a craft or whatever, but these guys go and they buy straight razors from like the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And then they recondition them with a, like a new handle. Like sometimes it's blood wood or it's like something really like nice and collectible and they really shine it up. And it's really kind of a craft kind of thing. I should, that would be, I would love to, if you want to be in my, my affiliates, that'd be fine too. But, uh, I really like the thing, you know, it's like a collab. I almost want that freaking expensive, man. They're like 85 bucks, but I would really like to like collect these things. But, uh, but I feel bad because I didn't use them. So I'm trying to learn how to use a straight razor and man, you will get a, if you can do it right, I can finally get like right about here. And I can, I can, I can do stuff, but I can't get real detailed yet. So I gotta, I'm just, um, and once I figure it out then I'll be proud of myself, but I like, I like doing the straight razor, but I think it's more of a nostalgia thing because I know it's great to know. Oh, I, this, this was used by some GI in the forties, right? Um, what's this is being beta or alpha, a perception or more. Do you want me to do an alpha show, an alpha and beta show? I don't know if I've done it. I, I've done it before. I've talked about alpha. I don't know if I've already done a comparative thing. What did you say here? As being alpha, beta, perception. Um, both. I can be or beta, a perception. Um, well, what's authentic to you? I think that's the other thing. I, I you know, here I am at the end. I wanted, to I wanted to um, actually drop this in there. It's like, what do you want as a guy? I've, I've asked the question before, like, would you rather be happy or would you rather be, would you rather know the truth? Because the truth, it often makes us unhappy and being happy, it means in some cases we have to ignore the truth. Now, it, of course we would love to have both. I understand. But if you had one or the other, if you had to be one or the other, and usually that's what it comes down to is like knowing something there comes a responsibility with knowing the truth. The truth will set you free, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy for you to accept or you to live with or you to, uh, you doesn't mean there's not going to be any consequences to it. There is. And I think that's what's really throwing off this generation of guys who are particularly in the black pill right now, who um, they're not ready for that responsibility. They were happy. They're probably dumb, fat and happy and ignorant in their blue pill conditioning. And then they had a trauma and then they became educated through the new enlightenment of the internet. Maybe they found me or maybe they found somebody or whatever. They found the red pill and then they went down the dark path and decided that they were going to be nihilistic and hopeless and take the monopoly game and go, fuck it, I'm out. So what do you want? Ideally, what do you want as a guy? Like guys will say, I'm living my best life because I just gave up on the game. Well, so you gave up, so you quit, so you stopped. Well, the game is rigged. Okay, well, even if it is, what do you, if it, if the game wasn't rigged, what would you want? If you could say, well, you know what, tomorrow we're going to take this, we're going to take this and we're going to abolish it. We're going to change society so that this is shameful. So that this represents the highest form of shame that a woman can have. And that the greatest thing that a woman can do is to have babies and be involved with one guy and be dedicated to that one guy and to be regardless, right? Remember that women are also dealing with that same question, happiness or, or truth. So the truth is this, tr that the thing is, is that men have, and in a way they're right, because we're not our sister's keeper. I, and I know like black pill MGTOW guys are going to say the same thing, right? We're not. And I would agree with you. We're not our sister's keeper. I don't feel any sense of responsibility for the choices that a woman makes. Not today. Maybe in the past that would have been like, you could, you could have made a case that if men were better then women will be better too. Well, in the age of the new enlightenment, women have, they've got agency whether that's moral agency or physical agency or practically or whatever you want to, however you want to define agency, women have, women definitely have it. This right here is female agency. That's the end result of female agency. This is what women choose. Some women, a lot of women, most women choose this. There are other women don't, you know, my wife didn't choose that. There's other women that haven't done that. I mean, you know, well, you're a different generation. Well, you doesn't mean that there, there aren't women who can choose that, who, who have a different outlook on things, but in a gynocentric social order where women are always correct and the female experience is always the one that we should be striving for because that makes us more human or that makes us more authentic, then yeah, then, then people are uh, more and more women are going to think that that this 
is victory. This is success. This is what we should be striving for, ladies. And it's not. What's that? wonder what that's going to look like when she's, like, let's say she's 30. What's it going to look like when she's 40? If she's already there. This isn't shame. This isn't like, ooh, you're going to turn into a spinster. I'm, I'm asking you a question. What, did, what does success look like to you? What, does, what do you want? I have all these guys who would say like, well, you know, I've, I'm living a better life. Or I'm, you know, these guys are leading men to the slaughterhouse. So you need to stop. And all men need to just not ever get married and not deal with women ever again. I mean, that's the extreme side of things. But never, never the twain shall meet. Don't even have sex because you'll get me too. And you'll be destroyed. You'll be, you'll be utterly obliterated. You'll kill. You'll get zeroed out. You'll kill yourself. That's not a, that's not a way like that. That dooms a species that will doom the species. If you say, okay, you know what? All the females go over there and all the males go over there and they never get to come together. Uh, occasionally they cross over and they have sex, but we're trying to keep those guys apart. We're trying to keep them apart. And we think that that's the ideal. We think that's a good thing that, you know, women on uh, girls on the girls playground and boys on the boys playground and nobody gets to go and you can't go over there and, and go play kissy kissy with Sally. That's success. That's victory. That's this, right? Never the twain shall meet. What is that with guys? Well, I don't, I'm living my best life because I don't have a woman in it. Okay. But is that ideal? Is that a good thing? Is it good? Like well, ultimately, like if, if women, like I, I'm, I've asked this question before and maybe this is like kind of stupid to ask, but I've asked guys in the MGTOW communities and the black pill communities, like if, if women were like amenable to like saying, okay, well, yeah, sure. Let's get together. I'm, I'm going to drop all the pretense. I'm going to be, I'm going to learn humility. I'm going to have insight. You win Mr. MGTOW. Uh, like what, what, what does that look like? What does success look like to you? What does, what, then what? Then you, are you going to actually have what, like, what if there, what if you took away any like danger or risk of approaching women? What if you took away me, me too? Right? I mean, figuratively, let's say, what if you took that away? Are you going to be skilled enough to actually go and say like, you can start a conversation and women will be interested in you? Probably not. 90% of those guys, probably not. But then they win because they shoot the arrow and they paint the target around it and they say, ha ha, I win. Bullseye. What's authentic? Why do you, what do you want? Do you want a long-term relationship? Like if you could, if you're like, if you're watching this and you're like one of these guys who's very like black pill or very down on, I don't say down on women, but like, you're just like, I don't care anymore. Like you're, you're too cool for it all. Okay. Well, what if you could have your, what if you could, what if it wasn't a danger? What if you, what if women were like, okay, well, what do you got? No, you're, you're not going to get arrested. You hear some authority, like here's, I don't know how, but naturally here's some, here's some, here's some authority. Like what, what does success look, look like to you? What is compatibility? What is, what is a, what is a, uh, complementarity look like to you? And I would ask the same thing of women too. And I think that's the, that's the main problem right now is guys are getting to the point where they are becoming like the feminists who go, uh, they're saying this, a, a man needs a woman, like a fish needs a bicycle. We're getting to that point. Well, actually, if we're not already at that point. And so then you get simps and then you get guys and you get incels and then you get guys who are you know, like every level, I don't know, would by order of degree of guys who just basically flip the monopoly board and they're done and they like screw it. I'm out. Okay. Well, what if this, what if the game wasn't rigged? What does that look like to you? What does success look like to you? Well, I want a girl who's going to love me for me. Okay. Why should she? <laughs> and what do you bring that what what makes you so love? what makes you respectable what makes you lovable should women not have standards should men not have standards i think they should i think both of them should but in this in, in a female correct society in a a gynocentric society where we define like authenticity based on a female experience that's bad yes but if that wasn't the case what is success for you i say this all at um, I don't know how many episodes I've said this is we're better together than we are apart. That's the, that has been the success of our species. We are the apex species on this planet because we figured that out because we're smart. We figured out how to, how to keep our babies alive, right? We, we our smart babies alive, our smart, helpless babies alive. And by, I mean, helpless. I mean, if you think, if you look at like a, uh, if you look at a, a horse, like a baby, like a foal, right? A, a pony, whatever. When that horse is born, that horse can like run within the first hour of it being born. 
and get away from danger and, and follow mama and whatever. It has a sufficiency, a self -suffic survival sufficiency within a few hours of being born. And it can get up and walk away and go and, and fend for itself or hopefully, you know, human beings, uh, primates in general can't do that because we're smarter. We need help. We need mama to nurture us until for, for eight years or however many years it is. And we need it. And because of that, mama is vulnerable. Well, because of mama's vulnerable and because baby's vulnerable, we need a strong man who can provide res resources. We need a guy who can, the th what, three Ps, protection, provisioning, and um, uh, uh, parental investment, a capacity for violence. Yes, all that stuff. So what's what looks like success to you? What looks like authenticity to you? What's a real man? Some guy who can do that. If you're a female, would you want a guy like you? Would you want a guy who doesn't have that capacity? Let, let, I'm, again, I'm saying if all things were equal. So like the, the game's not rigged and you were, and that was you, would you like, if yeah, I've thought about this lots of times. I've said this on this show. If you had a daughter, would you want your daughter to marry a guy like you? Would you want your daughter to be with a guy who is, you know, who, who, who criticizes and, and pisses off and pisses and moans while at the same time saying he doesn't care, but well, you do care. Otherwise you'd be indifferent. But if everything was equal, if you were like, what would make an authentic man? If everything was, you know, we got back gynocentrism was gone, but we're still kind of like, okay, we're on equal footing and I have something and you have something and we have an equal, we have like equal value and equal ch exchanges. What makes you the one that you be, what, what makes a guy, a guy that you would be proud to have of as your, um, your uh, son-in-law. I'm thinking about that right now. Honestly, I don't want to, I don't want a slob. I don't want to, I don't want my daughter to be with a, a beta chump. I don't want my daughter to be with a guy with, you know, head issues. I don't want, why, why would I want that? I want the best for my daughter. I'm sure she wants the best for herself. I'm sure my wife feels the same way. So what's authentic? What's, uh, what is, what's, what's the ideal? Like if you, if you said, okay, you know what, in a perfect world, this is what, it, this is what would happen. You know, I, I, and I'm not saying it's going to happen and you can sit there and piss and moan and never cross the abyss and be in your nihilistic, hopeless phase for however long you want to be in it. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know, we, we are, st you know, what's funny to me is like, we, uh, we talk about hypergamy and we talk about evolutionary psychology and we, we go and we just dig deep into these statistics and nuts and bolts about, Oh, you got to have a jawline here and it has to be symmetrical and you have to have this and you've got to have, you know, V taper and you got to have all, and it's like, I'm mean, like freaking Vitruvian man, man. You've got to have like, you know, all this, the, everything is like scientifically drawn out and, and triplicate or whatever. And we'll dig into it and like in all the minutia possible. But we don't see, and, and, and you're probably right. I, I mean, there's things that, that women look for physically in a guy, but there's other things that they look for in a guy as well, certainly in the long term. But we say, well, those are all taken care of. Okay, well, it, what if they weren't? What if we, like, why, weren't, why wasn't that such a big deal back in the day? Well, because we had something that was, uh, that was more easily exchanged, I think. But again... But we, we, if for getting into that level of detail, what we don't look at is the fact that there is a reason for that. There's a reason for those, that level of detail. There's a reason for like, well, why do women want a guy who's a strong jawline and whatever, or six feet tall? Why do they? Okay. If that's the case, I'm not saying it isn't, but if that's the case, why? Why is it that that's, you know, well, so they can protect. Okay. Well, are you going to sit there and piss and moan that you are not, are you 5'11 and you're not six feet tall? Why don't you find a woman who's 5'10 and you're taller? There's lots of, lots of workarounds, but there's a, there's a reason for that. There's a reason why you like, we want to, we want the best. We can, everyone makes comparisons. I mean, that's a survival adaptation. Uh, but so is beta to answer your question, uh, being beta, being alpha perception. Uh, yes, it is, but it's also, uh, it's also a demographic. It's also a mindset. There's a lot more to it than that. Cause you have to remember, uh, Assange, when I talk about beta and alpha, it is in abstract terms. I'm not giving you a, I'm not giving you a physical definition of what's alpha. You can look at guys like, you can look at guys who have short man's disease, like, like the guy who's like five, five. And that dude is just 
ripped and he's in the gym every day and he's busting his ass and he's got his and you know what to the five foot four girlfriend he has he's his alpha he's like more alpha than you at your fat ass at six foot foot tall so is it perception it can be is it contextual absolutely but again it's a it's it it, it starts here no, no, it doesn't start right here, man. <laughs> no, it's not. What's authentic to you? Authenticity. I need to do a whole thing on authenticity one of these days. Is that it? What's your favorite mode on guitar? I'm supposed to say Dorian, right? No. Um, do I have a favorite mode? Um, minor fifths. The devil's triad, of course. The devil's try the devil's triad is my favorite. It's not mode, but it's the it's the devil's triad is is if you listen to any ghost song and you're listening to pretty much listening to the devil's triad. Uh, go yeah, go go pontif or go go contemplate that on the tree of woe. Um uh let's just say what's an unusual mixolydian? I'll a mixolydian just because it sounds funny. <laughs> Actually, I don't have a favorite one. I, I don't know. Aeolian, Dorian, everyone uses Dorian. Dorian is the overused mode mode what's my favorite mode on guitar come on <laughs> what's good i listened to your first two audiobooks you've changed my life mindset for the better one itis is poison your books are the cure thank you son of batman Batman's a son. you are welcome my friend here's what you know what son of batman thank you for the five bucks but you know what would even be better than five bucks is going to uh amazon and rating those books as five star books that would help me out big time Alpha five one says, what's the deal about the hoop earrings? Damn it. You know what? Here, Alpha five, here's what you should do. Go and watch um, the interview I did with Sterling Cooper just Monday because I talk about that like for a while. Hoop earrings are, I'm not going to give you the detail. If you want more detail, go watch that. But I'll, t I'll just give it to you the short version. Hoop earrings are... Uh, are brought up as sexual ornamentation in a lot of research when it comes to sexual ornamentation. Like what uh, it it's, uh, has to do with ovulatory shift. So when women wear like tight red dresses, in fact, when they wear red at all, it's usually that's they have a women have females who are of a fertile age, oh, even more than that. When women are in ovulatory, when they're in the proliferative phase of the ovulatory cycle, that is when they are proceptive science words there there's another vocabulary word proceptive to having sex with alpha guy more alpha guys guys with more masculine features and when they do so they tend to put themselves into sexual situations such as girls night out or let's go have fun in vegas let's whatever um and they tend to put themselves into environments in which there is a possibility that they could find a guy who is going to meet the alpha requirement so that they can go have casual sex with that guy well that is that's one way of of increasing their chances of fertility the other is signaling with sexual ornamentation of which uh, we look at high heels to boost them up and show their ass off a little bit more because it forces that um, uh, makeup is changes um, substantially <laughs> um, and then hoop earrings are actually part of that if you go and you look at and and I said this in on Sterling show because if you know who Sterling Cooper is then you'll know why but if you watch porn in any way and you you will see more likely than not uh, and, and particularly for newer women who are in the industry they tend to wear hoop earrings when they have sex if you go and you watch like porn look for the look for the hoop earrings they stay on the red dress comes off the high heels might stay on but the the hoop earrings are uh, are I and I don't know why I don't know why a hoop, like why not the hangy thing? Well, the hangy thing probably because that would get in the way, right? It wouldn't get in your hair. Maybe the hoop is, is a guarantee not to like tie up your hair. And of course what they say, and this is the joke is, is the bigger the hoop, the bigger the hoe. There you go. That's what the hoop earrings is about. Go watch Sterling though. I, I de detailed it a lot better in there. Drape Tillman says the sisterhood actually have all the railroads and utilities. <laughs> the chance card will make you take a railroad and, or use it to, to utility. Yes. And you know what else they have? They have the get out of free, get out of jail free card. And they have the card that sends you directly go to jail to go directly to jail. <laughs> uh, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Yes. Women run the game. 
All right, guys, that's good enough for today. Uh, we're at 238, and I don't want to go crazy. So I will be on uh, Masculine Geek tonight at, well, 6 o'clock my time, 9 o'clock, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'll be doing D&D with these guys for about two hours. We're continuing our game. We're doing it a little early because it's the holiday season. So I'll be doing that at 9 p.m. Eastern time on the Masculine Geek. Uh, you can look that up on uh, YouTube, on your favorite channel. I, I've been on them lots of times. You probably already know them talking about uh really fun always fun i like i just you know one of these days i'm just have to go over there and just hang out with them and t shoot the shit uh uh was it uh, jack napier if you're watching i'd really love for you to come play uh, he's probably sleeping right now uh, i do need to go on jack's show uh, uh also last but not least uh rule zero is going to be on john uh for modern life dating his channel that's going to be 11 a.m 11 30 a.m eastern time on his channel on Saturday. That'll be the next time I do an official show, but an unofficial show is a possibility if I can corral Aubrey Huff and Rich Cooper for a quick show tomorrow so we can talk about this uh, this tweet that he put out about um, single mommies and all that. And I, I, yeah, I want to try to mix it up a little bit and like ask like, why is this such a big deal rather than like, oh, here's some, here's some advice. Don't get with a single mom. We've done that to death. But I want to I wanna analyze the response rather than the actual think so anyways that's coming up and i will see you guys later on tonight if you want to uh 9 p.m eastern on uh the masculine geek podcast channel just look up masculine geek on youtube and you'll find me all right guys thank you i'll see you